stuff of Keanu. Yes, it's true. Whenever we see you in another movie, get to wishing that you were in them all. Our hearts cry out, Keanu haven't aged a day in 30 years. Now we're looking back on your career. Can't get enough of Keanu. Welcome to Can't Get Enough of Keanu, the internet's premier Keanu Reeves podcast in which we explore the filmography of that great, ageless, enigmatic Canadian actor, movie by movie. I'm Patrick Willems. I'm Jacob Torpy. And I'm Matthew Torpy. Hello. Welcome to the show. We are back. <laughs> we, what do you think we should call our listeners? Like, uh... Oh, we should have thought of this before we started recording. Yeah, why would you <laughs> just um, throw the... This is good. Let's discuss. Yeah, Keanu I shouldn't have eaten the McDonald's. <laughs> Matt's full of McDonald's I right now. I have a McBrick, <laughs> and it's weighing me down. Oh, no. Oh, boy. And um, all the blood is Keen, going to the lower half of his so body right soul now. Soul Reavers. <laughs> soul Reavers? Yeah. Nice. Uh, Hello. Ooh, Reaver is not a bad one. Reaver. Reavers? <laughs> Reavers. No. Um, Keen. I, well, Keen on Keanu's. Keanu. Wow, yeah. this is tough. So many, yeah. when we were, like, when we had the idea for this podcast, so many people, including my sister, were just like, call it Keen on Keanu. And I was like, no, I'm not that's, going to. Oh, yeah, that's not a good name for the podcast. Right, because geez. whoever says they're keen on someone. Yeah, that's, that's like, like a, a British phrase. Like, oh, I'm very keen on him. I thought it was like a weird <laughs> 50s expression. I'm keen on, I'm keen it's on that one. It's old and British. <laughs> it's old and British. Let's we'll split the difference. <laughs> like, uh, it exists in 1950s America and current day London. Yeah, I've never heard anybody say I'm keen on this or that, you know. Yeah, people Nowadays. just be confused. But anyway, but to, we, uh, you know, with Josh Hartnett, we had heart throbs, heart heads. Oh well, heart you know, just lended itself. Put to your heart so hats much. on, as you would say. Yeah, put, um, put on your heart hats. But I, uh, uh, what, but like Keanu, yeah. uh, I don't know. Reaver, honestly, right now is the best we've got. <laughs> yeah. Reavers, you know, the, it's not good, back, but it's Reavers. the less of evil. <laughs> It's Reevesers, yeah, Ugh. that sucks. Yeah, Re- Reeves's piece. No, I'm gonna Reeves's pieces. No. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I see. Yeah, you t- uh, commit to that. That was funny. Yeah, yeah let's, let's let it sit and yeah, marinate we'll in the in the back of our minds. Also, for a while. also, we have an audience, so we can just kind of outsource it to them. Like, yeah, hey, you listen, guys, do it, li- listeners. You're sm- <laughs> you're smarter it. than us, and, yeah, and you aren't you are on the spot the way we are because we are just recording into microphones yeah. right now. So, uh, just you guys are a single hive mind entity, essentially in our in my conception of you. So, <laughs> just go do, do render that into a. a, a workable thing hit us up uh at keanu podcast on twitter uh give us give us all your ideas and we'll steal yeah. from the best we'll steal ones from you, and we won't credit you anyway we'll steal from you about what you want us to refer to you as yeah choose your name <laughs> and we shall call you by it or maybe we won't we'll just we'll yeah we might be like well, that sucks you'll come up with a great <laughs> name <laughs> well i mean yeah okay okay this is so this is a podcast about keanu reeves Hello. obviously and uh, we are now in still in the very early days. We're still in the first year of his career. Yeah, yeah. He had a uh, uh, he just blasted onto the scene with about three or four movies in the year 1986. Yeah, I so think we're still uh, stuck in that year. Both Jake and I this morning uh, yeah. read Vice's oral history of River's Edge, today's yeah. movie, and in that uh, that oral history, they mentioned that when he auditioned for this movie, he wasn't even signed to an agency. Not even signed to an Whoa. agency, and. Not, didn't that even was, that was a good will Matt. thanks yeah, whoa didn't even properly audition for the role as such like i think it was decided he was one of those guys you know when like a director casting director like they have Josh. the actor come in they just take one look at the person and they're like fuck it this is the guy keanu reeves apparently like walked into the casting office to shoelaces untied for the role. yep and he, they just said he was dressed in a way that looked like a boy trying hard to be an adult and they were like, that's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for for this role. So you got it. I'm sure he'd still had to run some lines, but I guess they had made their decision. As was there any song. other interesting tidbits? Just that Reeves was such a powerful presence that they couldn't not hire him for this role, even <laughs> yeah. though the only other thing on his resume was the 1986 movie Dream to Believe, a.k.a. Right. Flying, a.k.a. And I, it's hard Dream. for me to believe that yeah. Crispin Glover <laughs> was not also an extremely powerful presence because he is... Doing they a talk about him oh, okay. in oral history. Yeah. Well, so they were very ambivalent about him because he commits to his choices, however odd they are. And he's he'd already made Back to the Future. Yeah. That's so. Yeah. It, like, this is such an interesting cast. They said they couldn't afford any of like the the classic Brat Pack people 
from like you know John Hughes movies. Uh, right. And so we didn't have any of them, but then we had people who would become more famous. So Crispin Glover's uh, the biggest one. Yeah, uh, because of Dennis Hopper's. Well, Dennis Hopper's there too, as like the, the one like recognizable adult. Apparently, they wanted John Lithgow, and he turned it down. Oh. Too dark for John Lithgow. And then Harry Dean Which, Stanton. By the way, dude, he was in a bunch of like De Palma, De Palma movies. movies. Yeah. Why is this too dark for you? He's like killing. He's like killing people in yeah, like blow He's out. a psycho. Yeah, yeah but I. Uh, um, what is if it? And then wanna... they offered it to Harry Dean Stanton, and apparently he had a history of just passing along projects to Dennis Hopper. <laughs> That's kind of funny. And Harry Dean would have been good too, but Harry Dean Stanton, Hopper the man who looked eighty the... years old for thirty-eight years. Yeah, R.I.P. That guy was yeah, he fucking was... awesome. Yeah. Um, I but, mean, but they would also, they have such different energies because Hopper is so intense. Like, yeah. he has those really wide eyes, and, like, he's, like, he's, Dennis Hopper is always at an 11. Yeah. And Harry Dean Stanton is a, a way more laid-back performer. But, yeah, but both Dennis have Hopper, psychotic in this movie, aspects. like, he starts off, you know, he's, he's the point of comparison to John. So, like, he's kind of like... Wait, our listeners don't know who John is. We haven't explained what the story of this movie is, and most people listening have not seen it. I know, but all I'm trying Finish to say is Dennis that, like, point, we'll, we'll get into it. They are, they are two characters that revolve around each other secretly in this movie, mm-hmm. so that the point of comparison happens between the two eventually. Like, you get to see, like, evil, and then, like, I don't know, someone who's also fucked up and, and, and a bad person, but, like, not in the same way. Right. It, yeah, like... L- l- the way you know what yeah. I was thinking of me and Jake. One of our favorite movies is Naked by Mike Lee. This is I yeah. I'm glad you made the comparison because I was thinking about that movie. But specifically with this. the like piece of shit evil guy and then actual evil, right? The, like you get to Johnny in that movie Naked. You know he's he's a piece of shit dude, but he's like in pain, which I think Dennis Hopper kind of is. And then yeah. you've got like an actual psychopath come on the scene. Partially, I think, to render Johnny more understandable and likable and naked, yeah. By going like, no, this is a psycho. This is an actual well, to, to, human monster. To show the monster. difference between a damaged human versus a broken human, yeah, like you know what exactly. I mean by broken, like genetically broken. Right. Yeah. So someone yeah. who's done bad things, yeah. and then someone who is evil. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And uh, and yeah, so yeah, you've got Dennis Hopper there uh, as like the main adult figure throughout the movie. Feck. As, 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 <laughs> what a good right. name! As the, as 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 the one-legged former biker <laughs> who deals drugs to teens, but um, and, but then you got like Keanu, who will go on to be a huge star. You have Ioni Sky, who will mm-hmm. be in Say Anything. Mm-hmm. I think like the next year. Yeah, and uh, and this was also like. Was this her first? Mo- this is like one of her first things. She had done like a bit of like modeling. Bit yeah, of a there is a bulk vibe going on with her in this one, though. Yeah, I thought. And uh, and I'm trying to think who and who else. Um, I mean, I didn't really recognize most of the cast here, but then again, yeah, like you said, I wasn't sure if this is one of those you know teen movies, young cast, and all of them ended up going off to do particularly did, did interesting things. But I didn't recognize really most of the right. And cast also, here. Did, uh, we should say it's a film directed by Tim Hunter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, who who's most of his career has been spent directing TV. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he made some movies before this. He made a movie called Tex, a movie called Sylvester, and then River's <laughs> Edge, yeah. and then a movie called Paint It Black, yep. and then it was mostly TV from like 88 onward, uh, including he made like three episodes of Twin Peaks. and oh, uh, good and, for and, him. And he is uh, still working. Which season of Twin Peaks? Uh, one and two. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. And I, uh, but yeah, oh, like, he did most recently the movie Looking Glass. I remember the trailer for that. Working with the the essentially the actor's equivalent of progeny from Dennis Hopper, Mr. Nicholas Cage. I feel like Dennis <laughs> Hopper bore I both do not... Gary Busey and Nicholas Cage <laughs> um, fusion rings. Yeah, kind th- of. They saw him and were like, and were forever imprinted. Well, I they mean, saw how much was younger? Possible. <laughs> how much younger than? Uh, Dennis Hopper is Gary Busey. Probably not too much, but still, I think he's maybe one, like a half generation, like a decade, like behind. decade. Yeah, younger. yeah. I mean, I mean, Hopper's career began in the '60s. Busey's began in the '70s. '70s, yeah. yeah. Okay, but I, uh, but yes, yeah, so it's filmed directed by Tim Hunter, uh, written by uh, Neil Jimenez, and uh, and it tells the story. It, it is sort of a fictionalized. Uh, it's like a fictional story that is inspired by, by an a, incident from 1981. Yeah, yeah. a real life uh, murder case um, in this small town in California. Basically, 
Oh, I got, I got the actual case up here. Oh, yeah. It's a, the River's Edge is a fictionalized account of a 1981 murder case in Milpitas, California, in which 16-year-old Anthony Jacques Broussard strangled a 14-year-old girl named Marcy Conrad and then dumped her body near the foothills outside of their town. And for two days after the murder occurred, um, Broussard just kept bringing his classmates over to check out the body, and like nobody reported anything for the two for at least two full days before the story broke, and somebody, I don't know, right? Finally, somebody finally decided to say something to like a parent, maybe. And that's basically the premise <clears throat> of this movie. John, who yeah. who Matt mentioned earlier, uh, is the guy who strangled his girlfriend to death. Yep. And then he and and it, I love the beginning of this movie. Yeah. Uh, just like the the opening moments of it, where oh, the weird grainy, yeah, it's washed just, out footage of the river. Right. The opening titles play over this like black and white grainy footage of a river, and then the, the, the titles end. Uh, color seeps in as the camera like pans across, and yeah. then and it pulls back, and there's this like ten year old kid, kind of like <laughs> dirt baggy kid. Yeah. Uh, who. Who her, I thought was a girl for a really long yeah, time. And to be too. honest, there's like an and- androgynous quality to this actor. Yeah, and uh, he's, he's, he's got like an earring. He's got yeah. like sort of like a torn of like denim vest and yeah. stuff. Like he he is uh, Keanu's character's younger brother, right. and he's just hanging out on the bridge and he's dropping his little sister's doll into the Favorite river. Favorite doll into the river because he's just a little dick. Yeah, and then he goes the, psycho. and he's on a bridge and he just like uh, looks at, across the other side of the bridge and then he sees. John just hanging out by the naked dead body. Howling like a wolf. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty disturbing opening, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And then and the, we sort of cut over to John then. We lose Tim, the little boy, as he that, bikes away. And there isn't really a main character to this movie. It, no. It, Keanu's the closest, but even he sort of drops out for longer stretches than you'd think. It's right. like a true character. ensemble. Yeah. And there's like kind of like an A, B, and C story going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but Keanu, Keanu is the, quote, like, to the extent this movie does this, he's like the moral compass of yeah, it or right. whatever. I mean, he is, obviously, you know, you should know this, listen to this podcast, full spoilers ahead, uh, or just like starting right now. Uh, yeah. Keanu is the one that, yeah. that, that, you know, that finally alerts the police. Yeah. After, uh, People talk about it, like uh, Ioni Sky's character and her friend, I can't remember. Uh, oh, wait, wait uh, Clarissa mm-hmm. is who Ioni Sky plays. Yeah. Uh, they, at one point, <laughs> they go to a payphone and are going to call the police, and they don't know the number for the police. Yeah. And then and they, they make a, they call, like, the operator to, to connect <laughs> to the police, and then they just... They like chicken out and they yeah. hang up the phone. I love that they didn't. What's the number for the police? <laughs> I didn't get that. Why that w- was something was it was when did nine one one become a thing? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I was it not it always was a thing at the time? It's just in the eighties. I, mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, so much of this is about just these kind of I don't want to say dumb, but just about these teenagers who have so little. Like just motivation or like, like burnouts, uh, but yeah. they're specifically they are burnouts. Like right, we're yeah, following yeah. basically. They're so disaffected. The and freaks and the freaks and geek squad. Right. Yeah. And without the sense of humor, with a lot less of a. Sense yeah. of humor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, this is this is jumping way ahead, but one yeah. of my favorite scenes in the movie is after Keanu has alerted the police to the body, and he's right. being questioned by like a detective in the police station. The guy keeps being like, you know, like. How did you feel about this? Like, why did you tell us now? Like, why did you wait? Like, uh, what do you think about you know your friend do, like murdering her? Yeah. And all he says is, "I don't know." Yeah, he's like, he, I don't has, know. "He has no answer for anything. He yeah. just doesn't know." There's but a it, lot of scenes of adults sort of looking at younger, the younger characters in the movie with like just these incredulous faces as they're like. Nothing. We're not getting a little bit of emotion out of like your one of your close friends is. Uh, you guys just found her dead body on the side of a river. Everybody's poking her with sticks and stuff, and then nobody decided to talk or call anybody, talk to anybody about this. Well, that's it's, is, uh, but that's the theme, though, right? It's the crux of the whole right. movie, right? I mean, it's like yeah. a, it's like the a barely older generation going like, "What the fuck? Yeah, what the fuck is wrong with you?" And Keanu Reeves, who plays essentially the moral compass of the film, is still like barely the barely. moral compass. Like he is even struggling to still feel like an iota of, I don't know, some kind of like urgency right. to uh, what he, has happened. He doesn't alert the police because it was like the right thing to do. It was yeah. just because after two days, he's like, he just he kept thinking about like, it. Like kept thinking about like 
that dead body. Yeah. And then finally he just like, he wanted to kind of just relieve himself of, or like, like alleviate this feeling in some way. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's at least disturbed by, he recognizes his lack of feeling. He's Mm -hmm. disturbed by that, which is like, you know, a classic kind of second tier emotion. Yeah. Is like being disturbed by your lack of emotion. I don't know. I liked the, um, kind of like the impenetrable workings of anyone's mind in this though, because I I feel like even if it's not, it's not something as severe, like, especially when you're a dumb, like teenager, the, a lot of the times you're just so like lacking in experience that the enormity of, of random things in your life just overpower your ability to express them all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then adults are like, articulate. And you're yeah. like, I don't know yeah. what I'm feeling. <laughs> I mean, to get deep yeah. here for a second. Oh, let's uh, this is a deep movie, I would let's, say. Let's dive headfirst into the river. Let's get out of this edge. Yeah. <laughs> well said, Jake. Yeah. Okay. Beautifully said. <laughs> so when there is that scene after, and we're again skipping to like the second half of the movie, uh, but after the public is aware of right. the murder. And when Clarissa goes to school and then her, the teacher that she has a crush on. The most unintentionally hilarious scene of the movie. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, there's that one dweeb. That teacher should be fired. <laughs> he, sh- he should be fired. And uh, also I've looked up the quote and so I'm, I'm ready oh, please to, say. Uh, yeah, to pull it Set out. the scene up, Pat. Uh, and so the teacher, Mr. Berkwaite, uh, is like kind of leading a class discussion about loud, like how everyone feels about. I guess this. he teaches history. Uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Already, the premise of the conversation in the classroom is grounds for firing him. You should not be talking about like the recent murder of a student and then getting on your own students' cases about like right. their answers. And then when Clarissa comes in, who is yeah. the one person who like was friends with the murdered girl? Immediately, he like pounces on her and is like, "How do you feel about this?" Yeah, which uh, you were I, there, you saw the body. She was your good friend. Yeah, you must feel something. She's like, "Get off my back, and dude." So, but there's this one guy in, in the class named Kevin. Yep, <laughs> and of course. Ke- Kevin is basically <laughs> he, he. It's like he stumbled off of the set of Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah, yeah. and he's right here in this class, and he says. I just want to say it was horrible what those kids did. And the whole incident points up to a fundamental moral breakdown in our society. And then Mr. Berkwaite replies, thank you, Kevin, for your insightful, self-righteous indignation. I'd still like to hear from Tom. Yeah. And Tom's yeah. one of the burnouts. <laughs> and Tom says, would you just quit staring at me like that, man? <laughs> Give my case. Yeah. Ke- Kevin is the best. I just yeah. want to go to the local arcade and play Pac-Man. <laughs> But then eventually the teacher just even that pretends like shut the fuck up Kevin <laughs> yeah like because Kevin's like he's like you you know being self righteous just get you know just gets you brownie points for yourself it's yeah. not uh, action which is the the teacher has a good point just the anger is so misplaced for the context of that moment but like that is such an inappropriate way oh I I found for the that quote adult to behave. Uh, Kevin says don't you think violence is wrong. Uh, and oh, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> the teacher's like, shut up, asshole. And, anyway, no, and then Tom, the burnout kid, says, oh, fuck off, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> we, wasting pigs is radical, man. <laughs> Jeez. But that's the whole thing is, is like, you know, the teacher represents the prior generation, the like 60s to the 70s souring yeah. of the free love movement and, you know, all that kind of shit that's been covered a million times before. But like this movie came out in 86. So it was, I think, still working its way through the system as a whole, like yeah. dealing with the reverberations of that. Yeah. I mean, so, they had a whole decade ahead of them of that essential right. mood in like the, in, in younger people. So like every, with. everyone's, uh, everyone's intentions and angers and emotions are put towards the wrong thing in the movie. So yeah. the teachers just to me was like another example of a guy who's like, you know, he was probably, he's still super idealistic, but he's probably like starting to get bitter. He's just basically yelling at children because he thought he could like change young minds. And now he's realizing that like They're thing, just as bad things as are just ever. souring just even worse than before. And yeah. he, there's nothing he can do. And yeah, just everyone's like reacting incorrectly and then reacting the way they should have reacted to the previous thing about something else. And so the emotions are yeah. all happening. It's just in the wrong sequence and with the wrong in the wrong context. Well, it's funny too, because the movie just keeps, you know, it, it sort of hammers in that scene, right? Like the adults incredulity towards the kids reactions to stuff. But at the same time, it's like, you know, with a little bit of hindsight, this movie came out in 1986. I feel like nowadays people are more understanding of the fact that it's like some situation with gravity occurs and 
people can act in almost any way. Like there's no wrong way or there's no like one Even predictable like cereal, way that people react to, to dark and horrific situations. And at the time, I just think like a lot of adults didn't quite understand that. And maybe even there were probably some adult characters that did feel that way, maybe sort of distanced from horrific events or separated from it, but at least they put on the there act. There are barely any adults. Yeah. That's the whole thing is like, yeah, just Clarissa's just mom, mom is a disembodied voice. That's just like, Clarissa, are you home? She's yeah. like, yeah. And then she just leaves. In terms again. of, the, yeah, in terms of adults, like, we have the teacher, we have Dennis Hopper, Dennis Hopper, who is also drug dealer from the previous generation, but he's also just been so like beaten down. I by thought life. it was, because they also reference Easy Rider in this movie, so I just thought, oh, like, yeah. like there's that, a line just mentioning Easy oh, Rider. I thought I that they that wanted that. him specifically as like a representative of that previous era, yeah, basically. It, it makes sense, but he just wasn't their first choice. He was interesting. The, he was Lithgow. Th- like they wanted a they wanted Girl, a name. John Lithgow. Yeah, they impossible wanted, voice to do. They wanted a guy who was like a name to an extent, because like right. obviously they didn't have any other famous people in there, and Hopper was the guy they could get. And uh, but yeah, but you have him kind of as a contrast to the teacher. Mm-hmm. Because he's the guy who has like lost any sense of hope. Like he literally, his girlfriend is just like a real doll. Yep. Yeah, like uh, just this sex doll that he carries around. He goes into, <laughs> into public with. Yep, takes he, her to the convenience store to get some like small grocery items. Right, like I like, love that. I just yeah, me too. That's a great touch. I mean, it it it's basically is like a, a Lars and the Real Girl thing where it's like, oh, people just know her name. It feels like a touch that Dennis Hopper requested. Yeah, although it's I very, can't, I don't have anything to corroborate that. Well, because Dennis Hopper also these were the, I don't know if any of this is intended, but like. For me, Dennis Hopper seemed to be maybe a slightly alluding to like William Burroughs and how he shot his girlfriend trying to play William Tell. Right. And is yeah. like was like a representative of like the Beats. And then like he's also from Easy Rider. And now he's got this sex doll because he like is obviously deeply traumatized by the fact that he did kill his girlfriend so in a he's fit of doing rage. like a cartoonish homage to william burroughs kind of that's <laughs> maybe cool. like he's yeah. like some like hilarious pathetic figure with one leg just like you this you'll never age baby like yeah. <laughs> he's taking such good care of his sex doll because he can't deal with like a human being anymore right, well yeah. he also he has the story about how he was betrayed years earlier well how because he was in like a biker gang right, right. and then he lost his leg uh in like a, a motorcycle accident and uh, and then his his gang just ditched him. Yeah, well so, he he yeah he's it's funny he he both connects with the younger kids. He's the only adult that tries to in his own fucked up way connect with the disaffection that the younger kids are feeling in this movie. Because you're saying that motorcycle incident where he loses his leg. He talks about you know laying in the ditch and seeing his leg separated from his body lying like further away and in thinking the grass. that's my leg and thinking that's my leg and then also I wonder if like I can like if there's any beer left in the six pack that I had with me on the motorcycle right. like, he's like those are my first two thoughts just that's my leg I wonder if there's any beer left <laughs> and then the ambulance came and ran over his leg <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is like a beautiful and it popped story. like a water balloon yeah no, yeah. And uh, but I mean, <laughs> that's and such a good story though. It is. Right. It does kind of capture all of the like bizarre reactions you have to like incredibly serious events. Right. right. And then you look at this character and it's, you know, his uh the the you know, the deepest relationship that he has with anyone is with a sex doll. Yeah. And uh and he then he basically just hangs out with teens who need to come to him <laughs> because he provides them with something. So much weed and also yeah. pills, speed? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, he's well, just got a Lane, pharmacopoeia. Because Lane is a Lane is a speed guy. Okay, Lane. can we talk about Lane? Crisp and Glover. Can I just say one more thing about the? Go for it. The teacher, though. Oh, yeah. well, also, we haven't talked about Keanu's parents. Right, they're great to talk about too. So I just think the one th- problem I had with the the teacher scene, this hilarious one with what's his face. I already forgot yeah. his name. Mister. Uh, no, no, the kid, the dorky kid. Oh, Kevin. 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 Is well, that actually? Kevin, I just want to say, Kevin. He's such a disease. Yeah, <laughs> oh, Kevin. Um, so yeah, I, I like it feels a tiny bit on the nose. Like yeah, the teacher the is like kind of like maybe the screenwriter telling you how to feel, not to feel about the movie or something. Like it's just the teacher's kind of it, it's laying out the theme too hard. Right. It's like it's not as simple as that. It's like yeah. I know you're doing the movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you did a but movie, also you're a doing lot, a whole movie about it. A lot of this movie does like you know veer into like big melodrama totally and like very on the nose stuff yeah and, uh, like it, it it jumps around between sort of like the the like 
like disturbing subtlety of like those opening moments with just the kid just like witnessing this like yeah. in the distance it's from like a bridge Gummo at the beginning yeah, it right. is a little bit yeah and then you've got you know like uh the teacher having this serious discussion w- 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 <laughs> with the students like laying out the themes of the movie and and uh yeah and in our day we had the vietnam war and we protested the war we were in the streets and act- the actions that we performed had consequences that re- resonated throughout the country and for the better you know right. you know like but yeah. you guys like beer. <laughs> and in terms of the adults in the and movie, dope. the other notable adults are Keanu's mother. Yeah. Uh, by, by the way, important important note, especially in the, the timeline of this podcast, uh, this may happen again uh, through his filmography, but Keanu plays Matt. That's yeah. right. The, so we're going to call him Keanu, I think, as we talk we about it. We are going to call him Keanu, but he does play Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the New York Times once said... That Matt resembles Mr. Reeves. That is weird. <laughs> and like, Matt, at one point you did have hair that looked a little bit like Keanu's I in did this movie. For a brief period. In yeah. college. Yeah. Back when you do the, the classic uh, torpy hair flip. Oh, yeah. That's right. You probably had the longest hair out of any of us. Yeah, I tried it out. You know. yeah, wait, you wait, wait, hot grow John Wick hair. No. Do it. No, <laughs> no. It, it's going to look bad I'm now. I'm thinking it's back. <laughs> I'm thinking it's back, the hair. <laughs> uh, but so Keanu's mother... Yeah. Uh, it also, like they they mentioned that uh, the father has kind of like ditched them several yep. years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the mother is like, she's not a bad mom. She's uh, it's just that her kids are kind of like she has. There's three of them, right? Yeah. There's, she has two sons and a daughter. Keanu's the oldest. Yep. There's his dirtbag little brother, Tim. Right. He uh, never t- doesn't wear the same sweatpants every day. And right. jean vest. And jean vest and an earring. <laughs> and uh, the one who is like destroying the youngest daughter's uh, toys. The one who basically just wants to like be like, he just wants to be one of the burnouts. But he tries so hard that, that he it's becomes like, evil. That he's like gonna get himself killed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that he like the literally in the in like the last ten minutes of the movie, he is pointing a gun at his brother. Yeah. Right. And After so breaking into a drug dealer's house and who beating has a the gun. man unconscious yeah. and stealing his gun. Yeah. Right. The, 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 he has like the the worst imaginable like middle child uh, like scenario. Yeah. <laughs> but and so <laughs> so it's really like, like, <laughs> uh, but uh, Keanu's mom, she's just like overwhelmed and stressed out by yeah. like her kids like causing so much chaos all the time she's and beaten down by her own life she totally is and then her husband jim freaking stepdad the stepdad god damn it he's the guy he does pay the bills and put food on the table but he's a piece of shit keanu hates him uh he they have a very bad relationship and um and there is a line that I, I have I, I'm on the the quotes page on IMDb. Oh, their arguments are, were some of my favorite scenes in the movie. Yeah, but there's a part where Keanu is arguing with him, and he says, "The only reason you stay here is so you can fuck my mother and eat her food, <laughs> motherfucker, <laughs> food eater." <laughs> yeah, it's so good. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, and he's as Keanu's always standing like two steps up on the stairwell close to his room, so he can like dart away if he needs to. And he's yeah. like, "You're just hanging out so you can fuck my mom." <laughs> just runs away Don't and slams the door. <laughs> Yeah, I love. But then he's of, sweet to his little sister. He's sweet yeah, to his little sister, and he, honestly, he's occasionally nice to his mom. No, no, he, he like honestly for yeah. for a kind of like, you know burnout who uh, will like ditch school and yeah. like do drugs and stuff like that. He's like he, I mean, again, kind of is sort of the moral center of the movie. Yeah, he's like yeah, he's the guy who who you know tries to sort of take care of people and fix things mm-hmm. and like make his little sister feel better. He uh, he has a good reason for not liking his stepdad. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the stepdad is truly a total asshole. But is he? I, does he like? The stepdad beats his mom and essentially like does. lays around and does that. And, and just like either like sitting on the couch or at a bar yeah. when he's not at work. It's have, you don't see it. There's no scene where you watch the stepdad beat his mom, but it's implied. And um, he does that super shitty thing where like, you know, as the supposed breadwinner of the house just does that thing where he assumes all responsibilities and as soon as he sets foot back at home right, after a yeah. day's work my haven, and any my and house any sense of like criticism is just like i fucking slaved away all day yeah. <laughs> and you dare criticize me about not helping around that and then just like it's it's like a complete excuse to suddenly just lay one out on his wife you know but that I kind mean, of thing keanu's mom is one of the most tragic figures She's in the movie. She's very tragic, yeah. I felt so bad for her. Yeah. 
Because she's also like, she also like just smokes weed too, but yep. you never see her do it. But he's just like, Mom, can I have some of yours? It's that and she's scene like, is so All good. Right. Uh, and like, is, she, isn't the exchange like, uh, she's like, Where do you get that dope? And he goes, Don't worry, it's not yours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, there's, okay, there's this scene that made me laugh so hard. It's just like a throwaway mumbled line, Keanu says, where um, him and his mom were having the big argument towards the end where the mom like drops the serious shit like you're all mistakes and I wish I could just run out on you like your dad got to do I'm, like, I'm sick of raising you I'm done with being a, your mother yeah I'm done yeah. with all this mom bullshit I'm sick of all three of you and then you know the youngest daughter's like mommy don't run out <laughs> on all of us and then Keanu like for a second finally he's like about to, he's trying to run out of the house again he's like mom just alright like all right, whoa hey, dude don't run out on us I'm gonna borrow this weed. <laughs> he says, I'm gonna borrow this joint. So yeah. and it's a joint he stole from her room. He's like, Mom, everything's gonna be okay. Tim, our my the middle brother, I'm sure he's fine. All right, now I'm gonna step out and borrow this joint. <laughs> but I'm gonna come back and we're gonna have a nice conversation about <laughs> yeah, this. Like yeah. he's trying in his shitty way to, to be like, like nice in that connect. moment. Yeah. Also, yeah. and we should be very clear. You're gonna borrow this joint? Tim the middle brother at that time, he... And his weird nunchuck wielding friend. I love yeah. that. And they're, yeah. Who's like maybe <laughs> my favorite character friend. in the movie. Uh, they have <laughs> stolen a car. Yeah. Like like his friend his like nunchuck kid's parents' car, I think. Oh yeah. And are just driving around town. Like they have broken into Feck's house yeah. to well, try to steal his gun. Well, no, they broke into Feck's house. They tried to steal his gun. It wasn't there. So the the they found his giant stash of weed though, and they, and the, smoked, and, all and they smoked all of it. They smoked all of it basically, <laughs> and then just blacked out in his house. Yeah. And then <laughs> when he came home, they were probably still stoned, and they beat him and took his gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they get back in their car, and since they're both so short, it's yeah. the most comical. Because they're in scene. like a Cadillac or something. Yeah. It's huge. Right. And their it, little heads are popping over the dash. Yeah. Like, like they are the ones that I am worried about. Car. Like, I, I feel like you know, may, maybe the, uh, you know, so, some of the teens, you know, some of them might turn out okay. Some of them might just end up in like dead end jobs and just become, you know, just, like like waste their lives. Yeah. But it's these two, it's these kids, especially Tim, that I am actively worried about. Well, Tim's key, right? He's the one who first sees the murder or the dead body at the beginning. And there's Tim's kind of like the thread between will he go in the direction of Keanu's sort of half-assed sympathy and consciousness, conscientiousness. Yeah. Or will he go the route of John, you know, because he's the one that like kind of, he's like the kind of admires John in a weird way at the beginning. Will he join the light side or the dark side? Seriously. They're really doing that. And that's the generation scene at the end. Like it's just a more like, you know, it, 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 he represents will shit continue to roll downhill. Yeah. You know, will is, will he shoot his own brother at the end of the movie? Keanu, which I thought either that was gonna happen or like what did happen, you know, he'd eventually like act like a little kid finally, because he's twelve. Yeah. Right. And be like, <laughs> I Oh man, I don't sorry, dude. I'd but, like a comic book maybe. Yeah, and a hot right. cocoa. <laughs> uh, but I thought maybe the ending could have been they they, the the device of Tim bringing the gun all the way to the crime scene where John has been shot by that gun, yeah, might implicate. I thought Keanu was gonna get, uh, oh, like stuck somehow with the he crime. would get, yeah. Wait, arrested guys, at the end. let's let's jump back to the beginning and kind of work our way through the okay. story of this movie let's because it, it begins where uh, Tim witnesses. Uh, okay, this guy John. Yep. Uh, it's it's complicated. The guys, <laughs> the murderer. Uh, their their classmate who murdered his girlfriend. Who is a forty year old man, right? I mean, they 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 had teenagers until John, and John is just <laughs> yeah. He looks <laughs> he, he looks he looks rough. Yeah, for he's a at least like thirty five years old. He does. I'm I'm looking him I'm up sure now. He's not, and I'm being mean, but he's, no, he was twenty. He was twenty two. Damn boy, <laughs> Daniel Roebuck. Yeah. Uh, so All right. his name is actually Samson. Uh, but th- his oh, last right, name right, right. Is so- his uh, his last name sounds like toilet, so they call him John. As oh, in that's John, funny. John being toilet. like a like a you know a, a slang term for toilet. Right, right, right. Anyway, so we we begin with uh, Tim seeing him and just being kind of interested. He it, it's not like he's not like scared by it. It's like a cool thing he saw. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he returns home. And then you're introduced to Keanu there and the family dynamic with like a uh, little the daughter who's like, you know, who's actually really the most sympathetic character in the movie yeah. because she, she she's 
she, she never hurt baby. anybody. Yeah, she's an innocent a girl kid. caught in the crossfire. And yeah. the, and so uh, and of course Keanu is Matt. And then Lane, played by Crispin Glover, mm. shows up to pick up uh, Keanu in his cool Volkswagen Beetle. But with like Huge, big tires, big tires like and like a buggy, crazy kind of, muffler yeah. coming yeah. out the back. Okay, something. we need to talk about Crispin Glover. Yeah, he's nuts <laughs> because he's crazy. the whole time I'm watching this, I'm like, how do, I can't. I'm trying to figure out how I feel about. So this let's performance. let's preface then with what we learned from Vice's oral history, which is that Crispin Glover he does a very strange performance. But what we learned <laughs> from this, the the oral history that got published recently is that he came in fully formed with that character when he was auditioning for the role. And the also, casting director and the director... We should also be clear. Uh, this is probably around the time... I'm really wondering... I can't he, wait to he's pretend com- to do his voice. He's coming right off... You think you can do wait, it? Wait, no. Okay, he's coming right off of Back to the Future. Uh, this is before he has, because of his disagreement... Um, is cut from Back to the Future 2 and 3 and replaced. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> cut. Uh, but here is here is a, a big thing that I, I realized yeah. watching Crispin Glover in this movie. What? Matt and I talk a pretty decent amount about what famous actors Jake resembles. Mm, oh, mm. oh, you guys are going to say Crispin Glover because I'm going to get mad. Mm. Honestly, watching this movie... Handsome, not not before. He's just weird as shit. But specifically, Crispin Glover here in River's Edge. Yeah, um, my I hair think, is starting to look like this. <laughs> I think honestly, mostly in terms of fa- wear a little beanie. In terms yeah. of face shape, I think Crispin Glover resembles Jake more than most other actors we've discussed. Let me Google him. I'm I'm offended. I don't. Yeah, I guess we're yeah. No, I mean, if he, I, dude, if I've you rock- allow if you allow me, shitty Michael Fassbender. Yeah. Then. I'll, I'll take Crispin Glover. Jay, can we can we call you Hot Crispin? No, Hot and Crispin. I won't. No. <laughs> oh, god damn it! My friend, Jake, you know what? Yes, he's like married. a Hot Crispin Glover. Yeah, yeah. That will sell me to nobody. Thank See, God I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> Lock and load, no way out. Lock and load, hot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even look at pictures of him without getting. God damn. <laughs> Well, I mean, Jake found an incredibly weird one. Maybe we should just, I don't know, tweet some out. Yeah, I... Well, then, you know what? I'll, I'll take it. I, it's like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Yeah, The sure. thing is, he looks... Okay, if you take away all the weird stuff about him, and just but just keep it like the, the general characteristics... So boring, Crispin Glover. Yeah, you're like boring <laughs> mayo as boring Crispin Glover. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. I like his performance in this movie, though. Me too. I, I especially once I, I don't found know out, if I do. I think like, I think once I found out that he was uh, just taking amphetamines the whole time, that's when it did click. I'm like, of course, he's a drug addict. Yeah, he's like, insane. He's just doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is smoking weed, and he is taking speed constantly. Yeah. He also plays the most delusional character in the entire movie because he's the character that most firmly latches onto the idea of. Oh, our friend John just murdered somebody. What we need to do, what the right thing to do, is to help John get out of trouble. Not because let's we're report bros. him because we're bros and loyalty. And he like latches onto this and idea you, and commits to it. But he's, he's just al- like he's also the guy. His role, like in terms of his cast of characters, yeah. is kind of he's like sort of the leader. Yeah, a little bit. He's the guy who brings people together. He's like uh, the, like the driving force. But Everyone he, else is so apathetic, and he's the guy who drives around and picks people up and is like, "We're going here. We're gonna do this." Yeah, and uh, so he has to be sort of like the most charismatic guy. I don't think yeah. that's true. I think what he has to be is just simply the most outsized, bowl you over personality. You don't have to be likable to just sort of drive people around the way you want. Right. Yeah. That's true. I don't think. I think. But I mean. I, I mean. But you look at it like early on. Keanu barely says anything for a while. It's yeah. mostly Crispin Glover talking, and, right. you, and you get the well, sense he's on that, speed. that right. But <laughs> I, he's the one saying like we're gonna do this, and Keanu will be like okay. Like, right. I, yeah. like he, he seems to me to be sort of like the focal point of this group of friends. But but and, like Matt was saying too, um, I think in a movie that is specifically trying to tackle the idea of apathy like generational apathy, you do need just for the sake of like 
almost the plot to have a character that's outsized enough to get all of these apathetic characters to move around and do stuff. Right, because right. mostly it's about people dragging their feet. And Otherwise, doing you have nothing. a movie, yeah, of people sitting at home thinking about the but dead body they saw. I once. think it also works because like, watching TV. Lane, Lane, yeah, he's a speed freak, and he's constantly on amphetamines and just like going fast, fast. But like, they're also like, you know, he's lost. And in a different way, like Clarissa, I think, who was like initially dating him. No, really? Did they talk about Clarissa dating Crispin Glover? I thought they hooked up or whatever. Maybe. Maybe. She and Keanu do get together in this. But but back to Crispin Glover. The <laughs> feeling that I kind of got about yeah. him, like the vibe I got through these, the entire movie, mm -hmm. is that everyone else is like fairly naturalistic. In their performances, <laughs> yes. he's cartoonish. I, I felt like Crispin Glover was acting in kind of like an interpretive theater piece uh, <laughs> about this scenario, and when was somehow dropped in this. Yeah, I feel like like, like so much of his movements and uh, and just what he did with his voice, I uh, like. I felt like it would be, uh, uh, it, it would make more sense in like if this were on a stage and he had to with like especially with a project with, to the back especially yeah. with also like a minimal set yeah uh so he has to like he himself has to make up for the, the lack of scenery and props and stuff like that right and uh and but here in this movie the whole time i'm watching i'm i'm just like i i, I feel like he's in the wrong movie I, I like I enjoyed watching him, but it he sort of took me out of it the whole time. My my opinion veered scene to scene as well, but then somehow by the end of it, I came out enjoying the performance. Yeah, but, but I, like I, I was saying before, the the casting director also felt the same way you did. They were like trepidatious about casting him in this film because he was just doing this performance um, when he was auditioning, and uh, they ultimately obviously went with the decision to cast him. And they felt that it worked out by the end of the movie. They were like, at, in, at the end, I do think Crispin Glover personally works. That's like yeah. Tim Hunter's words. I, right. um, I, I'm with despite you. Despite being like, worried about that. Scene to scene, I was like kind of occasionally like, I was just like, why don't we reel it back, bud? Like, yeah, I, I definitely didn't like just love it like the entire time. Yeah. But I think like once I got the full scope of who he was and just like this speed freak, like still as apathetic and unsure of what to believe in or, or, or latch on to as any of them other ones. But he's like fixated now on trying to find like principles. And one of them is like loyalty to friends or like, he's got that kind of like Adderall focus, obsessive focus on like a task. Yeah. And like, I think, he, and he must've also heard, um, Feck's story, which I feel like probably maybe was like supposed to reference like, he took from that, like, don't don't abandon your friend. Yeah, lost like, his at the end of the day, of they might be able to still salvage some mm -hmm. semblance of a life for themselves. Because he's got like some affected. weirdly grim logic where he's like, okay, listen, like, what's-her-face is dead. It's done, yeah. okay? We can't think about that. Yeah. Now we have to think about John, because John's alive. Yeah. And, like, it's just, like, this kind of weird, twisted, and you can see him, like, getting excited to have a cause. Yeah. And you can see how the logic works despite the premise being right, questionable. Right. He like yeah. he is in no danger yeah. at all. Like he no. has no like <laughs> he was not involved in the murder at all. Him and, and John aren't even particularly good friends. He really. can't wait to perform an act of honor and friendship in this completely drugged out delusional way. Yeah. And that's the driving force because it gives him a sense of purpose and that's why he's driving around all night and never sleeping until he literally passes out in the middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. Right, which is I really like arrested. that part. And uh, yeah, <laughs> he's just like pulled straight up to a cur like the, the, the <laughs> curb at the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I I wish I enjoyed Glover's performance more. I don't yeah. even say I would say like I didn't enjoy it. It just felt stuck it, out of place it, for it, you. It just it took me out of the movie yeah. in almost every scene uh, because it felt like he he was dropped in from a different movie. Um, I, I I do honestly think he was miscast. Yeah, and his, I, I I like Glover in a, in a bunch of other stuff. I think he's really interesting. Yeah, uh, I I think the movie would work better if you had a different actor in this role. Yeah, I just love when he's just like, okay, listen up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> here's the situation. Yeah, I want my phone call. All right, what? That's him at the police office, <laughs> the police uh, department. <laughs> Look, man, yeah. I know my rights, all right? 
I want my phone call. You sound call. a little bit like a British guy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I don't know. It's like, I'm trying to do no, the... Uh, it's, that's the, not right. Uh, phone. How would you do it, Dude. Man? It's not right. He's doing yeah. like a Cali thing. It's a Cali thing, but it's really but it's mixed exaggerated. with like maybe Wisconsin or something. Like mixed There's like with a, Philadelphia. No, I would yeah. say like the Midwest, like North, yeah. North Midwest. John's got this dead body, and it's just near the river. All right. Wow, it's like you're almost a beetle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John's got this dead body, but it's, it is kind of like if We've George figured Ma- it out. Like once George McFly became confident in Back to the Future, yeah. If he then decided that he was gonna like try out for drama club and really commit to like this like it, you know intense you know uh, like. I guess back then in the 50s, like a greaser role. <laughs> yeah. And this is, it, to me, kind of, it's, it's George McFly going really hard in a theater production. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Glover is so famously weird. Like, yeah. Yes. I mean, then I remember, you know, the movies he directed. They're weird. They're weird. He, he's the type of guy that it just seems like you don't cast unless you're positive you need what he's going unless to he's do. Unless he's sniffing hair. He, you he's, know? Not, he's, he's not like <laughs> the type of guy that you're like... he's in both Charlie's Angels movies? Yeah, but he's the perfect guy because he's just freaky. Sniffing hair. He can't talk and he's <laughs> sniffing hair like you would imagine easily Chris, Chris Glover doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, or it, in What's Eating Gilbert Grape where I'm, he plays a very toned down but he's... He's in What's Eating Gilbert Grape? Yeah, he's the Who's guy who runs that? the morgue. Yeah, all right, we got burn your big fat mom's body. <laughs> Listen, here's the situation. She's too fat to go out the front door, man. So we're going to have to cut off your roof. <laughs> yeah, he has such a weird career, but but it's what's weird to me about him and Charlie's Angels. Wasn't he Equius? Is, Sorry. In what? Equus? Equus? No, he's Willard. Oh, he's Willard the rat. Yeah, the rat guy. In, in, in the <laughs> Again, remake of perfect, Willard. Right. Exactly. Charlie, Charlie's Angels is just funny because it's like like, a like McG cast him like in a in a big colorful action movie. Yeah. yeah totally. I like to think he brought the hair sniffing to the role. That's what I always believe. And then I'm once sure he again they were something. like, I guess he has to smell hair now. And yeah. the lest movie. we forget, uh, <laughs> Oliver Stone cast him as Andy Warhol in The Doors. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. And he works in that too. I haven't Wait. seen that movie. I shut that movie off. I couldn't finish it. I found the doors really annoying. I watched it like I mean, I my sophomore year of college. Yeah, really it's, long time it's ago. It's been a while. I yeah. uh, honestly, I mean, I I, I want to just look up. Not I'm not gonna do it right now. Right. I'm curious about all the actors that have played Andy Warhol because I know Bill Hader did in Men in Black Three. Yeah, and I just yeah. and it's just, that seems specifically like a role that they cast specific. David types of Bowie people played in. Andy Warhol, I believe. There you go. That makes sense. Wait, do I, uh, should I just do a video essay about the actors who have played Andy Warhol? Who is, Honestly, who is Warhol in the Scumbag Manifesto? I know the actor. It's that British actor who was in like Happiness and stuff. He has like the gap tooth smile oh, a little bit. Oh, who, he's yeah. in Chernobyl, isn't he? I haven't seen Chernobyl. Now he's in Chernobyl. Wait, what's Scumbag Manifesto? Like, I, it's not on IMDb yet. No, there's a movie called I Shot Andy Warhol. I Shot Andy Warhol. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, she yeah. wrote the Scumbag Manifesto. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Jared Harris? Jared yes, Harris. There we go. Oh, yeah, from, uh, from Mad Men. Yeah. And lots of other... Lots uh, yeah. of stuff. Millions uh, of things. Yeah, <laughs> son of Richard Harris. Yeah. And, uh, that man, wow. That, that man famous, is in 10 million movies. Drunk. <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of TV... I mean, Jared Harris is great. He is always really great, especially. But wow, that's I haven't seen this movie. Um, anyway, back to yeah. River's Edge. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, so Crispin Glover picks up Keanu, and uh, yep. and th- they go see Feck. Uh, they go. Oh, and he's described on Wikipedia as a neurotic ex biker and drug dealer. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, and I wonder how he got that nice house though. That uh, my guess left to him by his family. Okay, sure. And uh, and yeah, they basically like this is where we're sort of introduced to all the different characters as they drive around and and see everybody and uh, and then they you know they meet John and who just kind of like tells them just pretty casually oh hey I killed my girlfriend yeah. well John John like comes into his own throughout the movie like at first he's in a daze mm-hmm. sort of where he like doesn't really give a shit he's just kind of like feeling what he's feeling about yeah. having done it and then. Finally, by the end of the movie, settles on the fact that he loves it. Right. Yeah. And that he doesn't give a fuck about anything. And he yeah. just wants to, like, keep killing people maybe until he gets killed or, or caught. Yeah. It's like 80s The Stranger, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. We're just the- watching, like, you know, a... Okay, wait. Remind me, what's the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Um, I think it's, like, the I malevolence. Think I think a yeah. psychopath kind of has... There's, like, a... They're, like, a more kinetic... 
version of a sociopath. The sociopath is like a flat affect, just a complete inability to connect with any other person. No, in like no, an no. Well, way. Not necessarily. Well, like they themselves, a sociopath is someone who can like essentially just lie to your face constantly, like manipulate you, feel nothing essentially about like wronging you, using you. Psychopath could be a sociopath but they also have the ability to then not have a problem killing you, hurting you, that kind of thing. Okay. I'm pretty I'm, sure. I'm reading the difference right now. You need to go to the DSM. <laughs> uh, so so, yeah. so it, is this a movie about like where we're, we're like watching someone like accept their, their psychopathic tendencies? Psychopathy is, according to the DSM, can be thought of as a more severe form of sociopathy. Okay. So if you want to just, just put it on a spectrum, essentially. Sure. Like everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there you go. He is a sociopath who learns that he is a psychopath. Is okay. he a sociopath? Though? Or yeah, becomes more psychopathic be. as the movie goes on. Right. I mean, but he he has the he has the basic, um, like, what psychopath kind of the classic like. Ooh, I felt so powerful and in control and alive. Right, because yeah. uh, apparently he just said that he 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 killed her because she like talked shit about his dead mother. But yeah. did we find did we find out that that was true or or There's, did yeah, that someone end up else not even being that. the case? It's all coming from him. So, but is it um, coming right. from him or or are they like maybe she said maybe she said something about his mom? He's got a big problem with that. But then in his own account, didn't he just kind of like look at her and then just suddenly decide to do it for no reason? Yeah, they were just chilling on the riverbank smoking weed, and she might have like said something or like in his mind it's like oh she just kind of like vaguely complained about this one thing hey you, and then i just got it in my head to wrap my hands around her throat you know you right. know what i think the message of this movie is that the true evil playing the youth of the of 1986 the is weed yeah the oh, old man. the old dope they're all smoking the oh, that reefer and that is what has destroyed that generation yeah they're yeah. slonking huge doinks and killing each other Burning massive nugs of sativa. Yeah. yeah. And, and just into count, their lungs. Counting down the minutes until 420. Dude, it's yeah. a body high, dude. It's not a head high. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but I... Uh, you get that yeah, The weird... movie's like pro-Indica at the end of it. It's like, if they only smoked Indica. <laughs> they would be chill it as hell. It was a chiller strain. I don't know if that's the right order of it, but whatever. I don't remember. We don't... Uh, we don't smoke weed. Uh, yeah, really. We're straight edge here. Yeah. It, his, uh, just IPAs and bananas on this podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're straight edge, except for massive amounts of alcohol for me almost every day. Um... Do we get that weird scene with John though, where he's in his home? I don't know why they even show it. It's just him in his home with his his aunt, ailing aunt, who's like maybe demented, and he's reading to her. And she's like, "Are you going to read me a story tonight, John? Maybe the one about blah blah blah." And he's like, "Of course." It's like aunt. green eggs and ham, right? Yeah, like she's like <laughs> basically in her second infancy, as they call it. Yeah, and uh, you know, for a second, for a split second, I because this was earlier on, they show John doing this. It's like. Just this weird scene to throw you and make you think he maybe he's it's just one of those weird cases where he's got like this like bizarrely tragic home life and he's mm -hmm. bottling shit up, which could still be true. But like it yeah. sort of becomes irrelevant towards the end, that little bit of context, because like he's just evil. Yeah. 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 He but that, that scene threw me. I was like, maybe I don't know. it is weird. I'm glad they didn't do the too much on the nose thing where it's like he's reading his grandma's story and it's The Stranger by Albert Camus. And he's like, <laughs> OK. Yeah, Grandma, do you want to read uh, L'Etranger uh, by <laughs> Albert want, Camus? Do you want to read Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre? Yeah, No Exit. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds so good. <laughs> Can I have applesauce when we listen? Yeah, that is a funny scene because that yeah. never comes back. We never, never see her again. No, It's like um, the one scene in, that, in the movie It Follows that I found kind of annoying when they're reading uh, Dostoevsky's The Idiot towards the end. And oh, you're yeah. like, this is a horror movie and it was good and I didn't need like the scene where... Wait, when does that happen? I saw right that. Right towards the end. They, like there's a scene right around the end they of the movie. They just read it to you? When like one of the kids is reading a excerpt from the book The Idiot by Dostoevsky and right. you're just like, okay. Like <laughs> this somehow is, is, I didn't come is connecting to the themes of this movie. But it just feels so unnecessary, even if the director did have some like high flung idea about how you, thematically they're linked. If but you gotta annoying. do it, have an epigraph. At the, oh, at, at, that's the most you can do. Don't. Oh yeah, Any read time to me. A character. Okay, this is this is a general rule for movies. Don't have characters read excerpts from books. Really, like wait, wait, when so, is it appropriate or like when John does Wick it not? Three. 
Yeah. <laughs> Don- well, he's also reading. <laughs> what is he reading, John Wick? Dante's right? Inferno. He's reading Dante Alighieri, I think. Yeah. Or was it Dostoevsky as well? I wait, don't know. It, it, wait, they're in Russian section, so it's nine maybe. times that, out of that's ten, just, it's just the, the book that he has. Yeah, the stuff hidden in. No, but he. Right. But then the big basketball player guy assassin comes in, and he's he does the thing where like he starts reading before he enters, and then he's oh, like, right. and blah blah blah, and then he like slaps the book closed, and he's like, "Hello, John." Oh well, that's played for laughs though. Too. Right, right. That's funny. That's so like you can read. Thing. It's not a hard and fast rule. What we're yeah. saying is you can read, but don't read me like a fucking paragraph of some book because you d- didn't do it in the movie. I yeah. Mean, I, I mean, wait, guys, do you mean that you 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 don't like the way that uh, um, in the Twilight Saga, New Moon, uh, Bella, oh, no. Bella's reading uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, <sighs> in, in class and keeps referencing it throughout the movie. God damn it! <laughs> is that right? That that is true. I only saw the first one. I, I I haven't even I haven't seen the whole second one, but that like Romeo and Juliet is a big re- recurring theme, and they are like r- reading it in school. Does the well, baby eat its way out of I, her it's uterus? Not like I'm in holding the movie? that movie to high standards. Um, it's I've seen that scene uh, from. Uh, is it, I think it's Breaking Dawn Part Two. Um, <laughs> no, uh, noise, nerd. noise, dude. Uh, it's well because I. So Defend I haven't read yourself. the Twilight books, but I read like detailed synopses of all of them, and and the <laughs> I just don't want to be able to talk about it. I mean, yeah, exactly. On. And this is like I was like in, I think in college, and yeah, it's the fourth one that all like the bonkers shit happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where. Uh, Right, they uh, at, when when they finally have sex after the, they get married, oh, then, nice. it, then it's so intense that they like shatter the bed, <laughs> and then <laughs> it shatters like glass, even though it's made out of wood. Exactly, <laughs> they hit the resonant frequency of the wood. That's how fast <laughs> these blows are pounding. Yeah, and then uh, she has this super vampire baby growing in her womb, and um, and it's so strong that it, that like it's like like like. <laughs> Injuring her and like breaking her bones when it kicks, and then <laughs> honestly, this part of the book sounds cool. This yeah, sounds dope. Yeah, no, it exactly. sounds so wild. And, and then when she goes into labor, uh, the the <laughs> vampires have out. to like bite, the, like like bite the baby. They give her like a C-section via teeth. Ooh, teeth. A yeah, section. And that's then, good. And then the baby comes out, and the werewolf falls in love with the baby. Like really romantically, F- immediately. Uh, I no, feel like everybody's always no. been like, "Oh my god, the werewolf falls in love with the baby at the end of the movie." And I'm like, "But he's probably just doing like the whole, you know, I will forever honor and protect this child." No, no, it's oh, okay. It's From a, the love of this child. No, it's, love this child. it's a mix of the two. Um, pedophilia. But I am also a little. I, I, huh? It's so, pedophilia. Don't spoil it. <laughs> Ow. So basically, so it, it. Um, I think they call it imprinting. Okay. So sure. he imprints right. upon right. the baby, which, if I remember correctly, is named. Renesme. <laughs> what? And how the heck is the <laughs> up with this? Jake that's is a, been, that's it's a, a wacky name. I know it's been a decade since we should have known about all this information or whatever, but <laughs> what the heck is going on with these vampire like books? A, yeah. I, don't, I don't like it, but I, I at least know about it. <laughs> uh, but, I, I mean, well, what in the heck? Don't say I at least know about it. Don't make it sound like the fact that we didn't know about it makes us somehow... Bad. I knew yeah. that the baby needed to be ripped out of Bella's womb, and it was the only thing that I was interested in because the <laughs> idea of a baby kicking and just shattering your ribs yeah, it's is kind of extremely funny. funny right. To me. But so yeah. anyway, the werewolf does. Uh, right. Um, apparently, in this mythology, werewolves yeah. can like imprint, as in right. it's basically as like saying like. I will love this person forever and like be be with them and will marry. And them. so basically, what it, what it means is. Because since I think like werewolves like age slower or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Eventually, when that when Renezme the weird baby, because they also have built a weird animatronic baby that looks terrifying. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen it. No. Uh, it looks so weird. Um. Anyway, <laughs> when that weird animatronic <laughs> baby grows up, <laughs> uh, it, it it will marry the werewolf. Jesus. Awesome. But uh, imagine oh, if a pedophile was also a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's the Twilight wait, book, that guys. Sucks. There, there's no, <laughs> guys. Movie idea. Pedophile right that werewolf. Call it pedophile werewolf. <laughs> I mean, we could definitely take take uh, advantage of some sort of moral panic. Yeah, right. Exactly. This what is if, about this is what secretly about the just, neoliberal party? Yeah, the way that like, there was, like didn't just movies wanna... about AIDS, but it was like aliens and stuff. You know, exactly. This yeah. is a movie where it's like, oh my god, these uh, was it, these sex offenders don't just want to like you know like molest your children. They want to turn them into werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> or eat them, or, yeah. <laughs> Terrifying. Whatever. All um, I'm saying wait, is that I'm glad that he just read Green Eggs and Ham to his grandma. Wait, no, no. Ba- <laughs> back to wait, River's Edge. Back yeah. up, back up. I did not answer Matt's original question. What was your question? About Twilight. Oh, yeah. Um, so you wanted Good to know Lord. about the actual like uh, childbirth scene. 
Yeah. So it's shot. We didn't talk about it. <laughs> no. Well, you uh, because it, the the way it's written in, in the book is yeah. like an R rated scene. It's mm. a PG thirteen movie. Mm-hmm. So they shoot it in kind of like a kind of like abstract way, f- mostly as like a POV shot um, right. from Bello with like. You know the edges of the frames all like blurry and stuff like that. So you don't. <laughs> so like so it, I hate that. Yeah, it, it, it's it's annoying because yeah. you want. I like. I, I wish they just got like David Cronenberg to direct the last one. Gasper. Uh, oh, oh my god. Yes. Yeah, so no, that, go that inside her. That womb. would be a shoot yeah. from inside the womb. Right. Yeah. That would be a POV shot from the baby's perspective. <laughs> yeah. L- like you know, like coming as, out be- as <laughs> Beethoven plays coming out through reason. the ripped skin. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you don't see like the full detail. But I, I will say the important thing about that movie, the other part I've seen, yeah. is if you guys have not seen the final battle scene, no, it's on no. YouTube. Absolutely watch it because it's it just bu- it's bonkers. Well, here's what happens: um, <laughs> it builds up to like because there's this whole you know like vampire like government and royal family and right. stuff like that. People like they're Italian. Like, like Michael Sheen is like the, the leader of them and stuff like that. Uh, because he, he is he like their version of uh, uh, the West Wing guy. <laughs> Am I thinking of Michael Sheen or Martin you're thinking of Martin Sheen? Sheen? Am I thinking of Martin Sheen? Yeah, oh. yeah, the Michael Sheen, the guy who's played Tony Blair three times. Yeah, Michael Sheen. Um, <laughs> but here he's like a <laughs> vampire who lives in like Rome and he has long hair. Anyway, yeah. but it builds up to that they're all in this like snowy field and there's gonna be this big battle because I guess they've like broken vampire rules or whatever. And apparently in the book, what happens is they just like they all get there. And then, like the like the head, the high vampires see the baby and are just like, "Oh, never mind. Uh, we we're we're uh, not gonna fight anymore." Sounds like the writer got tired. Yep, someone got sleepy. But ah, it- that baby, it's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> blah blah. <laughs> never mind. It's so cute. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> Let's all have a nice <laughs> drink of blood. Well, <laughs> they're Italian, so that's all a cup of blood. <laughs> Blah. What are you feeling? Blood, bro? Ah, 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 ah. The Bella. end. Ah. Okay, wait. Let me tell you what actually happened. Sure. <laughs> it's so, fun to do Italian racism. Well, it was weird because the vampires, like the cliche vampire accent, that one is like Eastern European. Eastern European. It's Eastern European. Why does it sound? Why does? Why do we veer dangerously, dangerously towards an Italian? It's accent? me, <laughs> Dracula. <Yeah. laughs> Woohoo! This is Mario now. But wait, so. This scene in Breaking Dawn Part 2. Yes. What happens is, they unlike the book, they just do a full-on giant, like, superhero-style fight scene. Good. Because the vampires are super strong, and there is this thing that keeps happening in the fight scene. They, 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 they <laughs> like, the budget is clearly so much higher for this movie than the other ones because yeah. there's so much CGI in this in this fight scene. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. The I mean, vampires baby will just sake. rip off each other's heads. Just, like, grab a head and just rip it off oh, from wow. the body. Wow. That's and cool. So you just get these people leaping all over the place, just <laughs> murdering each other in the the most like comic booky way and only the, head tears like there's no other oh there's other stuff but, oh, okay. but but there's a lot of like it's crazy how they will just like <laughs> like casually rip off people's heads yeah but, i like that and does robert then, pattinson rip anybody's head off i i think so his head yeah. get rip off um but <laughs> but then what happens is then because also the mythology this thing is Pilot, so no, we, we gotta talk about River's Edge, my, my man. <laughs> <laughs> you got way too excited for this other movie. <laughs> yeah, look, we're, Listen, we're, you don't want to talk about uh, murky moral quandaries and not just a bunch of vampires ripping each other's dicks off. <laughs> Slow down. We're only the heads of their dicks. We're only an hour into the episode. Yeah, I'm yeah. assuming we, that's what you meant by We've head. been weirdly <laughs> on topic for yeah. the, for this, but no, honestly, but, too on topic. But. <laughs> All the vampires have their own individual superpowers. They're basically yeah. like X Men, oh, and cool. so, and then it turns out good. it pulls back, and this was actually just like the future vision of one of them oh who can like God. see the future, and she's like, "No, we'll all die if I uh, if we do this. So let's not fight." So basically, uh, they took nah. they they still had the same bullshit story as the book. They had but their the, cake and ate it too. Exactly. Yeah. You know what? Good on them, though. Yeah. <laughs> right. You go yeah. like, I'm not doing this ending. Or I am, but I'm not. But I'm also going to have all these vampire heads get ripped but off. But I also am not. Anyway, <laughs> all I'm saying is, watch that scene on YouTube. I am going to watch it on YouTube I will. now. You know yeah. what I will? I love a good decapitation. Um, oh, yeah. I'll watch it. And also, Michael Sheen has an Italian vampire. 
It's yeah. also lovely knowing what became of both the, of the two leads, Mrs. Kirsten, Kristen Stewart, Kristen Stewart, Kirsten Stewart, Stewart and uh, Mr. Uh, Pattinson. Robbie Pattinson. Our and pets. the fact that they're now like two of the best young character actors working at the moment. They are Robert the Pattinson's darlings of, 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 indie, of cinema. indie and international cinema. Oh, my it's God. Crazy. Robert Pattinson is just like he's on a roll. He's just going to keep doing a 24 until. <laughs> yeah, he just lives in their office. Well, he's Batman now. Oh, right. yeah. Now he's Batman, which is funny. Well, we'll see how that goes. He like he's decided to make money now, and yeah. so because he's in he's in the new Christopher Nolan movie. Oh yeah, and um and then it hasn't been confirmed that he's Batman, but it, it he's basically Batman. I mean, enough freaking publications put a bunch of headlining articles with like his mussy haired. There's face already a, grinning at there's you already a petition. Your new Batman to, to like have him <laughs> to uh, have him like removed <laughs> from being Batman. Well, he's weird. He's creepy in a way. Oh, I mean, he. he I mean, there's something freaky about I him. Th- I don't like him either. He's I, a bad Batman. I think. I think he's like. The, <laughs> I'm not going to pay money. You don't to know. Him. I think he's the best choice. You don't know nothing. You I'm think a, so? No, you don't. What? Yeah. No, Pat, you, we Pat. made a podcast before this one. You know the best choice. I know. I know, Josh. Josh. Okay. But here's the thing. Yeah. Here's so the chill. thing. Second best. Second they best. say it's it. good. Silver medal. They wanted the first loser. <laughs> someone. They wanted someone younger. Josh is forty. Josh is 40, he looks 32. He does. All right. Yeah, so no excuses. Bigger, stronger. (laughs) Look, all I'm going to say is this. Robert Pattinson, when he hits 40, is going to look much weirder than Josh looks when he's 40. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? He's looking good now. But he's got he's got a he's got an interesting face and I'm curious to see how it develops. It's gonna be severe. He's gonna look like Peter Cushing or something. Yeah, something's yeah. gonna happen. It'll be cool. He has that really intense brow. He's got a really intense brow. Yeah. That that to me is what's key for Batman. Josh has it too. Yeah, like the really that's, and, that's the only thing I need. That's thick, it. Thick eyebrows. Pro. What is what is this the what is the bone called here? The your nathic index is your jaw, and then what's your well, you're dropping some knowledge. I, I don't know. know. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out Jake, later. Jake, you're the anatomy expert on the on yeah. the show. Tell us. Uh, yeah, the the cabbage bone, <laughs> which is your big, what? you know. Why would you even your coconut bone? Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> anyway, River's Edge is a yeah. movie starring Keanu Reeves <laughs> that came out in 1986. If you're so just he's... joining us, <laughs> John killed that girl. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't feel and since we were even a little live bit on it. NPR. Yeah. Uh, so That'd anyway, all guess. I was saying is I was weirded Terry out by Gross. that scene because it means nothing. Yeah. It, it's, it's an odd choice. Also, like, you know, Josh is the moral compass, you know. Uh, Josh? Josh, damn it. I'm s- old habits I'm die still hard. In love with this him. is a podcast about Keanu Reeves. <laughs> 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 Look, we hard at heart, but we can't get enough of Keanu. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get enough of Keanu, man, okay? Oh, I also think Clarissa is a bad person. The girl that, um, yeah. Doesn't really say anything, but then she kind of sides with Keanu towards the end yeah, of the movie. Yeah, what's surprising is in this film, she at no point does she explain at all oh her my reason God. for <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jake. Yeah. <laughs> all right. How did no one make that joke I, yet? I stopped myself because I was like, "It's too." That took bad. me a second, but then I got it. <laughs> and you're like, "Wow, Patrick is so smart." Wow, I mean, like the, the, the other friends just kind of like peace out. Yeah. Like clearly, like they're there, and then all of a sudden, there's like. They get a hilarious scene where they're being interviewed by like the news. That's good. Too. Yeah, and they're just like, "Yeah, man, like, we we were like messed up by it, but like, we didn't feel anything because like, it's like our subjective experience, man." Yeah, and also that's I play Tom, guitar. right? Yeah, <laughs> I love yeah. that button. Right there. <laughs> that, that, I also play guitar. I also play guitar in a band. <laughs> the whole and they clearly don't give a shit at all about the <laughs> their dead friend. Yeah, that whole thing of like, uh, there's a great moment in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang that does it, where someone is is using a like a news interview uh, where they like witnessed a tragedy as a way to sort of like audition and mm-hmm. also just like look good for like if they want to if people want to like talk to them more or like get cast yeah. in something. Yeah. So here's something though about this movie that I thought was interesting. Tell us, Jake. Um, we can get some water. It's about <laughs> Matt runs away as Jake starts Jake's a new about topic. To speak, so I'm gonna no, I can just no. Leave. This is a good opportunity for you to leave. <laughs> um, so we have all these kids; they're having trouble showing any sort of empathy for this murder. It's I know I'm sure it's a choice, and I'm sure it's mainly because of space and how to structure the movie and pace it. But they never they never show you what their friendship with this girl was like. Anyways, the beginning of the movie, right? And there's a small part of me that wonders whether or not their apathy towards what happened would have more impact if they showed even snippets like some kind of flashback or maybe even like 
we get 10 like, minutes before there's where like they show two her shots where she's of alive. flashbacks and the two shots of flashbacks is just her getting strangled right is, no, is there any point there's, where they just show her there's one alive? That, that's just her like sitting there yeah not doing nothing yeah she doesn't speak yeah Apparently also, like, and in the oral history, they have the whole part about casting this girl, because mm-hmm. it's, like, the most thankless role. Hey, so uh, we need you to do full frontal nudity, yeah. lay motionless yeah. for hours, and at no point will you get to speak. Yeah, and right. your character development is rigor mortis. <laughs> right. <laughs> is so how, you will get stiffer as yeah, it goes. Yeah, yeah. Your, your decomposition <laughs> is okay, your... Okay, so did he take off her clothes after he killed her? I think he had sex with her and then killed her. Uh, when he's strangling her, I think she has all her clothes on. Yeah. So I think he oh. takes them off afterwards. What a fucking weirdo. Well, I guess he didn't uh, establish if, like, he's a total the necrophile sicko. aspect happened. I think... <gasps> I think it's implied. You think so? I mean, well, lightly. I don't know. It's suggestive. I think it maybe opens interpretation if you want to think, like, wow. ooh, I don't know what he did. Jake, and that's creepy. to a dark place. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, you took this movie all to I'm a dark saying, place though, is that the movie... <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> The casual murder of a woman, girl. Um, yeah, I think maybe they just tried to be suggestive about that, and they don't. They purposely aren't giving you any concrete clues, and the fact that she is new just makes you feel even more unsettled. Right. right? I mean, after well, you see the dead body, you're well, like, "What the fuck did this guy do?" Also, like, when you do consider how openly he speaks about the experience, I yeah. feel like he, if he had then had sex with her dead body, like he would have he would have said, said, said that, yeah. yeah, because he would also be like, because he was talking about how it made him feel and all of that, and I feel like. You know, he'd probably just continue speaking about that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say no necrophilia. Me too. Okay, that's fair. my take. That's a fair point. And um, I think, he, I think he was just weird and wanted to like see her body. Sure. Yeah. And like yeah. see it dead without anything else on. Yeah. If yeah. He's getting that, which is even creepier in a way. The, right. Like, that Norm Macdonald joke about being a serial murderer. I forgot what, what it was. Is it? But the, <laughs> one of the lines is just like. So then I went anyway. I go in the shed and. I do that thing that makes me feel like a god. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, McDonald, everybody. That's what I was just thinking of. Uh, uh, but, but so in terms of like working our way through the story, we, we get next to the scene where uh, John takes, the, like after school, yeah. takes them down to the river's edge. That's right. And yes, it uh, is. to see the body. And they're... <laughs> they're all just kind of like, no way, dude. What? You put a doll out here. Come on, bro. Yeah. They walk up and poke it with sticks, and it's super and, realistic. And they they have the, the slow realization, but then no one really freaks out. Yeah. yeah. And so and, and, and people kind of freak out just but weirdly, you know? Right. Like, some people sort of like, oh, and then that's all you get is, like, a little bit of a <gasps> surprise yeah. reaction. They bully their one friend with a job into driving them out there. Yeah. Oh God, and then he, yeah. like, he's kind of, him and, and Keanu are the most pissed. Yeah, his friend's just like, I want to get the fuck out And by out that, I mean, it's like, I don't want to look at this. I want to leave. I won't yeah. necessarily say anything, but I just don't want to be here. In this moment, all I want to do is get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Like, why did you take me to go see this? Right. Yeah. Um, and then they get mad at their friend Mike, I think his name is, the one that tries to immediately book it back to his car. He's like, why the fuck did you take me out here? Yeah, dude, Come on, fucking this our- is... And then he just runs away, and Crispin Glover rushes up to him, and he's like, we got to help John, man! It, like, Get back here! Uh, immediately, he, yeah. he he is so on the side of the guy who who yeah. did the, did the murder. But so okay, guys, Far out, guys, dude. hypothetical, yeah. sure, uh, like situation here. Um, so, at least in my life, I have never, to my knowledge, I have never killed had a anybody. friend. <laughs> I've never killed a person. That's true. Uh, I'm, uh-huh. I'm I'm saying it. Like, on the record, on the podcast. Nice alibi, I, dude. I, Patrick Willems, have never <laughs> yeah. committed a murder. That'll help oh, for, great. In front That'll of two help for later, yeah. Exactly. Okay. But I also, to my knowledge, have never at least had a friend who had murdered someone. Uh, and, like, in our high school, when we yeah. were there, it's not like, like, I do not recall any student murdering another student. Nope. No. No. And just um, suicides. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would... When, especially like once uh, in the movie, when this becomes public and they go back to school and, you know, Mr. I don't know, Wit, what was uh, Witwicky, <laughs> Mr. Witwicky uh, of, of the order of Witwickens uh-huh. uh, is, you know, talking to them about this. I was thinking like, how, how would I have felt if like something like this happened? I would have felt happened? probably close to nothing. If I'm being genuinely honest. It depends on if the amount someone of I did you are. So like, yeah. right. If you're in high school and... 
Okay. So, I'll, I'll, we can talk about something a little dark here. Um, when I was in college... We had a classmate who was with us who did like, I did like several class projects with him and he ended up killing his own mom during the school year. Oh, And then we had wow. to take him out of the class. Wait, and we had to take him out of the class? No, sorry. We had to take him out. I mean like the, the school, you know, like Removed obviously him. expelled him. He was no longer at, in, in school. <laughs> and then so halfway through the semester, though, he was just abruptly not in class anymore and everybody knew what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, how, if you don't mind me asking, how did you find out? It was in the news. And uh, then our professor also brought it up, though, the following week, because I guess he felt it was his duty to sort of just explain, you know, this, like, a sudden absence. Although, honestly, he wouldn't necessarily have needed to do that, but I think I think the, I think my professor was aware that, like, enough people in the school were talking about it, that it would be weirder if he didn't address it, especially if some of the class already knew, well, this, and we're just like, like, is he going to talk the, about it? Isn't it the university's responsibility only to address deaths on campus or something like that? Yeah, so maybe this was something that our professor was just taking upon himself to right. talk to our class specifically because he was just, that kid was in our class, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, like, mm-hmm. we had lots of conversations with him. Um, the situation's different. The kid wasn't a sociopath, so far as I could tell, and like the context of the murder was 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 different as well. But I don't. We need to go into it because it's a little dark. But anyways, all I'm saying is, um, <laughs> all oh, I'm saying it? is that just generally as a class, right? Suddenly your classmate's gone for this really incredibly bleak, like horrific reason. But you know, nobody knew him that well, so it's just like having like this. It's it's like being told this strange, horrific thing, mm-hmm. but there's no pers- there's no intensely personal connection to the story. Um, so in a lot of ways, it feels like hearing something say in the news that's horrific, right? In so, a way, so you, you don't there's have a, like there's an eeriness and like an unease because it's like that kid was actually sitting in our classroom, right? But, but and this d- terrible thing happened. But you don't have the grief because but you, have you haven't that. like, you know. The person who's gone or like who, who who died isn't someone close to you. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not grief. It's not like a sense of like um, like hysteria or anything like that. It's more just like a really upsetting eeriness. But yeah. That, but then that goes away after like Quickly. a minute because just your life resumes itself. Right. Yeah. Um. And this guy being gone does not really affect your life. Right. Nobody in the classroom. Well, I mean, as far you, as like, I knew. As soon as I've as soon as if it's somebody I've had like an interaction with. Yeah. Even that would like create an unsettling atmosphere for a very short period of time. Exactly. It's exponential how how little my empathy goes out. Right. Tend, like realistically, um, not my sympathy, but my actual like emotional reaction. But there's anybody. only so long you can focus on something like that if you're not directly connected yeah. to a terrible situation right. where you're, it's just, you know, your, your mental capacity to like, or your, even your mental willingness to like keep processing this terrible thing. It's just like you got, like everybody has to move on with their lives. But then, then there's like the next step from it, which is the characters in this movie. Right. What happens when your friend. Yeah. Well, if that's Pat why I thought the movie me. was weird. Right. Okay, death. Pat strangled Matt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, wait, 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 no, wait. Whole other story. No, actually, we're right, right here, family, right now, though, in so this it's, podcast. It's a little different. Yeah, yeah let, let's do it differently. So for me, yeah. if if I, Jake strangled Matt to death because <laughs> you're just uh, you, neither I'm of you are, are my siblings. You're just my friends. Again to me. Right, you're just uh, my friends. But before you're my friends, you're you're mostly just like my co-hosts. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Business associates. Co-hosts, then friends, second tier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that, that I, <laughs> wow, we're getting real dark. Yeah, would you be sure sad if I died? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, wait, bigger question. Who would I be sadder about of the two of you? Bigger don't question. answer. Uh, don't here. answer now. No, you, this is bad. Yeah, this is not going to be good. so bad. Let you, me, let me say this though. This is good content we're making. Oh, uh, it's great content. Um, let me say this though. This is why I thought maybe to the advantage of the movie, because it would be good to have some, in some way, shape, or form, established that connection between this poor girl that gets murdered and how she, just the different ways that she was incorporated into that group of friends. Because, because of the way they shoot it, it does feel still like a distant thing. It's like as if people heard about just like quote unquote like a classmate they barely knew and something terrible. But does happened. it work on that level though? It does work on that level. You but never get that connection even yourself and you expect to feel it through these characters and you don't so everything is like frustrated well, guys i'm gonna i'm yeah. gonna bring up a, a little a reference point that i think is very relevant especially considering yeah where the body in this movie was found twin peaks 
Yes, yeah, Sarah Palmer or Laura Palmer. Laura Palmer. Laura yeah. Palmer. Uh, yeah. We, you know, she's dead at the beginning. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time Nude with by her. a body of water. Yep. Yep. Uh, although they at least gave her the, the dignity of being wrapped in a shower curtain. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we spend a lot of time then with, uh, you know, her classmates and like learning about her and, and their relationship with her yeah. uh, without... Th- that has some little flashbacks, although yeah. they're a bit more kind of like dreamlike flashbacks, mostly. And and I, and like like and this is way before we get to Firewalk with Me. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fire uh, before we go off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> before David Bowie shows up and Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> you mean when David Bowie walks down a hallway? Yep. <laughs> and then fades away. Yeah. Woo. Uh, but what yeah, but, 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 but that is like, um, of course, like the tone of Twin Peaks is so different, but that is also like largely about these high school students yeah. dealing with the sudden murder of their friend. Yeah. Although but the big difference a, there is that they don't know who did it. Right. And, and also that movie it's is, about a mystery being solved ostensibly yeah. in the first season. This is about a complete lack of mystery and everyone just stiltedly doing nothing right I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm mostly thinking of the way that plays out where like again she is dead right and we're introduced to her friends before we know anything about her or like have seen their relationship with her and and here also you know we don't we even less uh do we learn about you know their relationship with her yeah, but it's a good exactly. point of comparison because while twin peaks is kind of mimicking uh, soap opera kind of levels of of emoting uh it is it, it 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 is more cathartic or like you know because they're actually grieving her like pretty intensely like everybody right so, they're they're pretty broken up about it while, yeah. while while these kids they they don't know how to feel and and yeah just that idea of like they're high all the time too i think you know basically yeah like just trying to numb it Right. And Twin Peaks is also like so campy, a lot of it as well. well. Yeah. The tonal. Yeah. It's like full on in the the melodrama. And, but yeah, here, just like the the idea of, you know, it takes them days to, to, for anyone to even like call the police. Yeah. And, and I'm curious about their relationship with John is like, uh, like how, like how close is anyone to him? I mean, right? He seems like this. He seems like a friend only in the sense that he's like that friend that you have that's there that nobody quite <laughs> knows who the connective friend tissue is. Where it's like we're all really good friends, and John's always with us when we hang out. Were they but all like, even really good? Does friends? anybody hang out with John just one on one, really? <laughs> and it's like I don't think so. Right. They don't really, to be honest convincingly feel like they were a cohesive unit of friends well, anyways thing. before this happens they're just all like a f- they're all a f- like connected by their disaffection yeah and like some vague sense of like being unsatisfied and and listless and yeah. directionless they none of them seem that close I, until honestly uh keanu and clarissa but it's c- weird get together but th- yeah. see i i don't know why i i cl- clarissa weirds me out a little bit like just the second she doesn't do anything, and I don't. Hey, she 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 dials the phone that one time. She dials the phone that one time with Pick that other phone. friend who's who is purely out to lunch and just like <laughs> yeah. just, just stops caring almost instantaneously. Clarissa, yeah. I guess, is yeah. Again, like like Keanu's character, like through the fog of their apathy, they have these twinges of like, man, maybe I should like do something. So, but but Clarissa is so starved for any kind of uh, just sort of. Um, I don't know, like human emotion that like, you know, she, she has a big old crush on her teacher just, just because he's a passionate child of the seventies. Yeah. And the second Keanu, Matt goes like, yeah, I just like, it was weird. I kept feeling sad about the, that our friend's dead. And she yeah. was like, let's have sex. Yeah. <laughs> and like, she's just like, I can't tell if it's like sad on her end or like kind of weird and fetishistic. Like she's just like, it's so hot when any, when any man has feelings whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting to a weird section of the movie too, where the director tries to make like very odd anachronistic visual comparisons between the moment they're having sex is the same moment that John is recounting in flashbacks the time that he, when he was strangling the girl. Oh, and so true. they intercut, uh, Keanu and his, his sex scene. What is the actress's name? 
Ioni Sky. Ioni Sky. Great name. Their, their sex scene in the sleeping bag with the flashback scenes of John strangling because the Because John to is death. recounting his murder to Feck because John was hiding out in Feck's house for a little yeah. while. And that, but then they decided to go ha- get some beer and like hang out for the night. So you have this disconcerting visual comparison between these two things. I guess maybe the point is to show, you know, two quote like similar in the fact that they are both acts of passion. But look at how and, and, wildly and different connection. acts of passion can be depending on what the act is. And look at how gross it is to com- put them side by side sometimes. I get, yeah, it yeah. could just be mere shock value, but probably... It could be. Th- this is honestly part of my uh, issue with the movie. Not yeah. that scene specifically, but just uh, the way it... You've got like the like the big melodrama of some stuff along with like the 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 generally like subtle portrait of like, you know, modern teen apathy. Yeah. And uh, And then you've got like... Naturalistic performances alongside Crispin Glover going, <laughs> All right, well, Crispin, g- giving like 110 yeah. percent, and and uh, and I like uh, th- I like a bunch of stuff in this yeah. movie, and I like it, it all on paper. Um, I kind of wish it were either like all like you know all kind of low key naturalism or all high melodrama or like, and it it ends up to me just like a little muddy. Yeah, it's and, not a perfect movie. It's, right. It, it, it does have like a little bit of a tonal um, inconsistency that's not to its strengths. Yeah, because my favorite parts are are both discreet from each other. Like I love, I love Hopper and Crispin Glover because they're two insane people and I love their performances. Yeah. But they don't always work. And the other thing I love, which is like, like I was saying before, the weird kind of mistake is like almost like gummo vibe of like, you know, somewhat downtrodden, boring, kind of maybe de- slightly depressed town mm-hmm. somewhere in California. And like, like the little brother and his friend, like shooting crawfish in a bucket with a BB gun and I stuff. I mean, like, that's one of my favorite things. That's that stuff. Like that stuff is both like, just feels like such a specific and it's also depressing and it's sort of like grim, almost comic violence. And I, it represents a lot of the things that are happening. Yeah. So I, I like that. I agree with you. I would say, honestly, th- to me, the intro was perfect. The right. scene that it sets. And then it, the movie does not maintain with that tone yeah. to its own discredit. Like, There's a very art house right. feel to the beginning. That oh my God. It's right. dissipates. And the comparison to Naked is pretty good. Even just talking about the soundtrack. If yeah. you listen to the strange sort of guitar plucking, it's a cool soundtrack. Soundtrack, it's it's pretty damn close to yeah. what would then in the future be the soundtrack for the movie Naked as well. Well, it's just it's like an American '80s version of the same angry young men kind of. Remember when in England they had that whole like string? They I think they that yeah. was like what they like unofficially the 60s and called 70s, it. Yeah, yeah. just With like, like pissed if off. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. If and like Saturday evening, Sunday morning, or whatever that. Uh, Even like Alfie or whatever. Alfie Kess is kind of mm-hmm. in that, yeah, is in that realm, yeah. Rat catcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, but this fits into that, uh, just just the whole uh, scene of like '80s American teen films, where you have like the John Hughes movies on like one end of the spectrum, and then you know, uh, like. Like Heather's is on there somewhere, which is sort of like a response to like the uh, like the the optimism of of the Hughes ones. Yeah, that's yeah. like a comic satire, the, right? And then you've got this, satire. which is which is kind of like <laughs> just like Edge. like the uh, the 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 not link, the, 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 the not not yeah. satirical, just like the the dark, like pessimistic uh, take on like eighties teens. Yeah, it it must have been wild to go see say like a John Hughes movie that year. And then I'm pop in for another teen movie and accidentally wait, catch River's in Edge. In the n- 90s, wasn't there another movie just called The River about some kids that accidentally drown one of their friends? Yeah, and, and it stars uh, Josh from Drake and Josh. Is, yeah, right? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it was... It's in like why. the 2000s somewhere. But there's also I'd never Bully, seen this one, Bully. Which I never saw. Johnny but I, Depp? No, Bully... But, um, what was that one? It's... Uh, Who's the guy that found Harmony Corinne? It's that guy. Oh, Larry Clark. La- Larry Clark. He did a movie called Bully with like Michael Pitt. And it, oh, I know the, I've never about. seen the movie, right, right, right. but I remember the premise. Now that I've seen this movie, the premise of that movie, which I guess I saw a trailer for, maybe is, that is why I remember. Killed. It's similar. Like a bunch of disaffected teens murder somebody, and then the movie is sort the, of about their what cover about up. 
What about the uh, the with Pony Boy and the like? Uh, the Outsiders? Yeah. Touch, I've actually touch never the seen The Outsiders. I don't know what that's about. Neither have I, but, but that's also like set in the 50s. Yeah, that's, right. That's like early 80s. They're true uh, and It's like the, there's a cast overlap with some like Brat Pack movies. Sure. But that, uh, you know, that, that's like, like Coppola adapting okay. like an older novel. Like yeah. that, that just... It, it doesn't feel like it's stretching. Like, sorry. No, no, no t- totally relevant to bring up because it's an '80s movie about teens. But it doesn't feel like it's about '80s teens. Yeah, uh, it just happened. I feel like like it just happens that that came out during that decade. This does feel a little bit like Reefer Madness, kind of moral panic though. This movie, right? Like, it's grim. It's like, like like look how bad things are for like the youth of today. Because I mean, yeah, everyone. Like how oh, dire the world is. <laughs> the movie like is unrelenting in how any of any character introduced is kind of shitty. Yeah. Right. And also, I mean, except for like maybe the mom, but even she could be considered just a completely overwhelmed but still derelict parent. Like everyone is kind of a piece of shit, and any good gesture is like the barest minimum that can <laughs> be done. I mean, if we want to like jump to the end now, yeah. I mean, like, like, yeah. like Dennis Hopper. It doesn't happen on screen, but Dennis Hopper kills John because he's realized like that this guy is just basically a psychopath. Yeah, like there's I, no rehabilitation. Potentially in this the man's most future. effective moral decision of the whole film. Yeah. Like if you had to, it, you know, in a dark way, he's the only one who's doing what the fucking teacher was talking about. And it's which and is it's like great, acting, yeah. like killing, you know, you know, I don't know. Well, the scene's affecting, too, because you have essentially the character that did the same thing he does. But the missing ingredient was that he is still a empathetic human with who doesn't have sociopathy. You know what I mean? Like it's a he's, weird. He's, he's a horrible character and he did a horrific thing. And um, he's like one of these guys. It's not you're not supposed to like cheer when he does this, but it is a. I thought the scene was interesting just because they both did the same thing and right. you're watching somebody who's on the same playing field as this young kid and looking at him and hearing him talk about how he killed someone. He's like, I killed a young girl too when I was younger mm-hmm. and you're a monster. And like in my <laughs> own twisted head, you still need to like, uh, I need to shoot you as well, a Dennis result Hopper because only, it's not going to work. Dennis Hopper's character fact like yeah. seems to need you to still love somebody yeah he's like but i did it with passion i killed my girl i loved her right you're like what? Yeah. meanwhile john is I trying felt something. to yeah john is also in his own monstrous way trying to make a human connection yeah and D- dennis hopper basically right at the end says like i'll be your friend and I- i'm wondering if maybe dennis hopper really or feck really did care about john and that's why he was able to shoot him finally yeah like that like if any of these uh, teens some were like tortured causality there that I'm not quite also yeah out. but well, I, I know what you're saying one thing I'm curious about is um so also uh, when the night that Keanu and Ioni Sky like hook up yeah. they're like in in a park mm-hmm. they're clearly somewhere down ri- or up river from well them. clearly not very far away because no. the, the, John is also just like firing a gun to like feel powerful. Um, but anytime there's a gunshot, they hear it. Yeah. And I'm like, how that far? Like, how small is this town? Yeah. Uh, It's probably pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I thought they were in the Pacific Northwest until I saw some palm trees and stuff. Right. It it says California. Also interesting that I just learned now. Yeah. Uh, the cinematographer on this movie is Frederick Elms and the same year as this, he shot Blue Velvet. Ah, oh. another Hopper joint. Yeah, and then he and uh, Dennis uh, Hopper is so good. Now he shot so crazy. He shot multiple uh, David Lynch movies. He shot Wild at Heart as well. Mm. But then he also shot the, underrated. Yeah, uh, but then he also yeah. shot The Ice Storm. Oh, and, damn, um, another also great movie. And then, Dark, K- probably the rot. best the best monologue about farting I've ever heard <laughs> in that movie. But but like between Blue Velvet and The Ice Storm, this guy is really like. The the guy the cinematographer you get if you want to really like paint a portrait about like the dark underbelly of like bland suburban life yeah, yeah basically and uh, and and since then he's actually become uh, one of Jim Jarmusch's uh, main guys he he shot several of of Jarmusch's movies like he shot like The Dead Don't Die Patterson oh, wow. uh, Broken Flowers Coffee nice. Cigarettes more movies about people who don't have emotions yeah I'm cool. just just and but this is one of his earlier uh, <laughs> this one's yeah oh, oh he actually, he shot Eraserhead. Oh shit! Yeah, he so, shot a racer head. Yeah, Damn. Same, that's cool. Same, that's, that's like my favorite. Same yeah. cinematographer. Good and, ass uh, resume. I just thought that was interesting. But it, anyway, <laughs> but getting back to like the Come final on, scene of the resume. movie, um, where Chris McGlover finds John's dead body with yeah, the right. bullet hole in his head, and it's the same scene where 
Honestly, maybe the, the the most optimistic thing about the movie is when Tim shows up and he finally he they stole the gun from Feck. Right. And he finally because Keanu's been like he Keanu like beat his younger brother up earlier. Yeah. And he finally like points the gun at him. He Keanu talks him out of it. He does not shoot him. So like that kid, it's where so much of this movie has been like, will he like be fully like corrupted and yeah. and, and go to the dark side? He doesn't. Right at yeah. the end, and to be fair to to Keanu's character, that actor has the most punchable face. Oh my god, I have yeah. seen, and I know it's a child, but <laughs> but I am gonna lay that out there. The just sneering, sardonic, doe face that he has, just man, just right for a fist. <laughs> Was that kid the elf in Legend? No, no, that helps no, 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 Tom no. Cruise That's get that through Children the castle. Of the Corn kid, isn't it? I don't know. It was I just a guy. thought. I think it's that kid. Don't worry. Guys, I'm looking it up right now. I am curious if that actor who plays Tim did anything after, though. Me too. He's an interesting... It's a very recognizable face. He's an interesting looking young kid. Yeah. Um, But so, yeah... Oh, okay, wait. Okay, wait. Here's... uh, So, no, he's not... He's not in Legend. Um, (laughs) Damn! (laughs) uh, His second credit is uh, he's a kid in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. It's the Um, best one. Uh, <laughs> good, no, good movie. I like it. Yeah. Uh, he's uh he's in Near Dark. Um, the Catherine Bigelow movie. Yeah. Is he a little vampire? Uh, I don't know. I don't. Oh, I don't recognize the name. Um, he's in the movie Teen Witch. Well, he really loves like spooky Halloween things, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. I'm scared. <laughs> in 2007, he was in the movie Wizard of Gore. <laughs> <laughs> he was in Ghouls. He was in the Spiderweb Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a that's a that's a good deep cut, Matt. Yeah, there we go. But yeah, but, <laughs> but, but he was but, in pumpkin face. <laughs> oh, uh, Matt, stop he's saying in, the titles. Skeleton school. <laughs> <laughs> he's in Halloween Town. <laughs> he's in Halloween. Town. No, he, uh, he, uh, to listeners, he's not in those movies. He um, is in the movie from 1990 called Death Warrant. Whoa, whoa scary. Death Warrant. <laughs> But basically, at the end, he does not shoot Keanu. And Jake, you're my little brother, uh, and we have other littler brothers. And yeah. I've we've all beat each other up. Oh, f- I tons of times. Beat Wait, up my brother Ben. Got- he said, and I believe that this was completely sincere, that he wanted to fucking kill me. <laughs> yeah. Wait, right Wait. in the face. And if he would, he could he would have really hurt me. Yeah. If he for that m- split second where his emotions overtook, after I like. Hurt him too much or whatever. Oh, can yeah? Can I say a story about you, Matt? I know. Yeah. I was gonna say, like, when, oh, I, when yeah. did you guys last? This is embarrassing, but yeah, you can say. Wait, it. when did you guys? No, last, I don't know. Well, when did you last beat each other up? Oh, maybe this time. Honestly, this was in Madison, L- L- like last yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Last year this we morning, got in a huge fist fight. When Jake put too much milk in my damn coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I offered you a fresh cup of coffee. Yeah, and then you ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> so, me and you were hanging out behind your old friend Paul Kentner's house. Okay, is, yeah, this is, is this a story you're remembering? This is, yeah, this oh, is Paul. sad to me. Okay. Is it sad to you? I don't no, 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 share it. I don't okay. give a shit. Um, because the reason it's important to the discussion of this film is because um, I feel like the look I saw in your eyes before you committed the acts you committed <laughs> upon me was similar to maybe how John yeah, looked at uh, this the is young apropos. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways. We were uh, hanging out at our, you know, your buddy Paul's house in his backyard. This is a little suburban. People. Paul, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Paul, come on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways, we were hanging out in, in his backyard, and we had Chinese throwing stars for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great that we got this our hands on bad. those. I forgot that and we how were, we got And we them. were literally just throwing them at each other and seeing if we could dodge them. <laughs> Wait, w- were these like actually sharp? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they were weapons. Blades. Legit blades. They were spinning projectile blades. <laughs> so you could have straight up died. We used to throw giant showers of rocks at each other though too. And then one time one hit me directly on my front tooth. And I was like, we have to stop. <laughs> that game was called Meteor Shower. Yeah, that game was called Meteor Shower. <laughs> Obviously, it always ended with someone going, we have to stop. (laughs) The rules were, you got a bunch of rocks, and you shouted, meteor shower, and threw them into the air. And then it was up for the other guy to dodge them. Yeah. Uh, A lot of our stuff was just dodging shit. Yeah, there was a lot of dodging based (laughs) games. Anyway, so we had a game that was called, uh, you know, Chinese Throwing Star. And um, 
we were throwing them at each other and one kind of like nicked you a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm -hmm. I forget where, but like I threw it and it, it cut you a little bit. And, um, for some reason, I guess we weren't anticipating that that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that somebody might get cut by the stars. <laughs> <laughs> so you became so enraged and we're like, I'm going to kill you. Well, you nicked my beautiful face. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I got so, so you were like in tears, and then I got so scared seeing you get that angry. We're little kids, by the way. This this wasn't recently. Um, yeah. I should just preface that. I got so scared by seeing <laughs> you so enraged that I started crying as well. And I was I was terrified, and you sprinted towards me, and I just turned around and like ran for my life, <laughs> and I, I ran like around the house up to the front yard. And then, like, classic horror movie style, I tripped on something. <laughs> <laughs> and I fell to the ground. <laughs> and I could hear your footsteps. Uh, like, just like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> it was so scary. It was scary. And uh, just thump, thump, thump. And I just, I in a moment of pure terror, just turned over onto my back and just displayed my whole, like, Weak, <laughs> prone belly. belly. Did you pull up your shirt? <laughs> I just said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the look, when Matt's standing above me, the look that I saw in his eyes, I'll never forget. Describe he, it. He, uh, like, um, you know the scene when Quinn talks about the sharks? And they're they're dolls. I had a doll's, <laughs> yeah, doll's yeah. eyes. Lifeless mouth with those black eyes yeah. like a doll's My eyes. My pupils completely dilated from pleasure of, of what I was about to do. <laughs> and Matt stood over me and I was just begging for mercy. I was just like, please don't, whatever you're thinking about doing, don't do it. <laughs> and Matt just picked up his foot and stomped on my solar plexus as hard as he could. <laughs> It was. I'm so ashamed of that. Though. And I feel like I remember just like bumping into like our friend's parents, and he was just like, "Man, you guys should go home," because we were just both like at that point just like <laughs> crying. On the crying. I was scared by how I much like, I wanted to kill you, yeah, and I, I started like, crying. I had like no wind in my stomach. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> So how because old were maybe you guys should go home. You guys should probably take a nap or something. Yeah. How old were you at the time? Yeah. Um, so probably I like maybe like seven or eight. Yeah, maybe, I was maybe like ten, I think. Yeah, maybe ten. And I was then, ten, so you were eight. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe even younger. I, I can't yeah. remember. Because we left New Jersey. Was it time. just one stomp? Yeah. Just one, just stomp. one stomp. And then I, I, was, I remember being like startled by... I was like, if I did the more, scariness. if I did more stomps, oh yeah, then I then Jake would maybe go to the and, hospital. And violence dead. begets violence because I did something pretty similar to Ben like a year later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like when you use that yeah. downhill, it's that, the whole that cool move Matt taught me. Well, I kicked his feet out from under him while he was chasing me with a shovel, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the shovel hit him on the head. <laughs> what an idiot! And then, well, he, to be fair, he was chasing me, so I kicked That's his legs out from move. under him. Yeah, what? Do you, how, you spin around and like we were, it was winter. Sweep kick. It was winter, so he was carrying the snow shovel and he oh. was chasing me. He was gonna hit me with it, and uh, I we were on like a icy part of the sidewalk, and I turned around and I kicked him in his like ankles. Nice. Dude. And he slipped, whacked his head like on the sidewalk, <laughs> and then the shovel fell and hit him. <laughs> and then he was laying there really so quietly. Combo. He was yeah yeah he was laying there really quietly, and I'd never felt more alive. <laughs> Yeah. As I stared down at his body, it was unmoving. <laughs> and um and then I said, Ben, are you okay? <laughs> and Ben, like, his face was like buried in the sidewalk, so I couldn't even see him, but I just heard him like from muffled. speaking out muffled, and he just went, You fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just was like, Ben, get up, I'm sorry. And then Ben just wouldn't get up. And so I just went, I went into the house and I sat down on like a part of the sofa where I could see him out the window. <laughs> and I just, I just like sort of monitored him and he, and he sort of just lay there for like maybe five more minutes <laughs> before getting up and coming into the house. Too. I do want to say congratulations to both yeah. of you because your reactions to this violence you committed does confirm that both of you are not psychopaths. Well, here's the thing though. The point was, that's pretty common. The point People was the passion their of like a shy, like yeah. being a little kid. Yeah. And like when you get both angry or sad, like it's it's a just an all in. It's all encompassing, right? Yeah, those feelings are so 
like like I was scared, but I still after they're stupidly intense. I was feelings. spooked by how yeah. hard I stomped on your chest because like yeah, you can stomp scary. a heart that way and shit like break my ribs. Yeah, which so, thankfully didn't happen. So like the fact that I was even capable of like doing it at all. Yeah. Um. Is all it takes, and like if you just have a pistol, like <laughs> yeah, you know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying I would be capable of like shooting somebody even as a kid at all, but like, but just these are, these are like lesser examples of like the all encompassing stupid blind feelings you can have as a kid. Right. And then as like, um, and then (laughs) thankfully the immediate like kind of regret that your body sets in right afterwards, like sort of like this ingrained moral compass that people have if you're not a sociopath where you immediately regret something but that's crazy that's like a that's a whole other conversation yeah, we, talk about, we can talk about like the genetic basis of morals or something i don't want to get into yeah. some fucking like steven pinker shit yeah, uh, yeah but like like um even if tim had shot keanu yeah but didn't kill him and then was immediately like just was a little like little kid style just like cried or something would yeah. have been a somewhat hopeful <laughs> kind of way to to play that out as well, in my opinion. Yeah, it, yeah. At least showing that he had some sense of remorse. He cares. Or or, I mean, like that. Yeah. Like, because to be fair to Tim, like his I mean, life is his rough. Whole, his life is rough. His dad's gone. He just probably watches his mom get beat. He like uh, all, his brother as a role model. He's not that great. He's nope. also just a punk who he's clearly trying to emulate in some form of yeah. uh, like appreciation or like. A str- striving to be like his brother yeah and like everything in his social system tells him to become like just a hardened v- sort of violent asshole yeah 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 it's bleak yep it's very bleak I, so they have an open casket funeral uh for the girl and roll credits and roll credits and c- push it arms on her wide face. open and i guess we're supposed to sort of regard the uh the sort of alabaster Death mask innocence of, of the catalyst for all of this realization yeah. of, of of the lack of any morals, but but it, it's more than that because the guy and the, the teacher told me that that was yeah. that it's more than that. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and so that's River's Edge. Uh, any any final thoughts? <laughs> when no. I want to just say any um, few words, final summation of Keanu's performance. Oh, uh, I thought Keanu was real good. Me too. Uh, like, d- just. Like, you know, this is so early on in his career, and especially when contrasted with Chris McGlover, uh, <laughs> it could be a bit well, affecting our judgment. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, I, you know, he felt really natural to me. Like, this felt very much just like, I mean, he's probably playing a character who's not far from just who he is normally. Yeah, that's what I got the sense of. But, but the whole, the, the, yeah. we'll get into this a lot as the podcast goes on, but just, you know, Keanu's inherent, like, like way of speaking and demeanor and stuff like that. That is, you know, the thing that like, especially like in the nineties would get accused of being like wooden and flat and stuff like that. That's just how he talks. Right. Like like back then. And he's, he's, he really underplays it until he finally kind of like, you know, he explodes uh, when the cop keeps questioning him. And when he's just like, I don't know. Right. And then in the time when he's uh, yelling at Jim, um, but, but through the whole thing, I mean, like, I thought Keanu, like, was really effective as, like, the, you know, the closest thing to a moral center of the movie, and to, to being the character that, uh, with whom we're supposed to, like, connect the most, and also just, you know, again, he has just a, a really watchable screen presence, like, you know, I could see looking at this guy and being like, I think, yeah, like, yeah. of the people in this movie, he does seem like a natural one to like yeah. have a bigger career beyond this. Yeah, and his weird sort of impenetrableness and blankness that he kind of brings naturally to stuff. Once again, like John Wick, we're gonna say blankness, blankness. so much. <laughs> works in works in his favor if for yeah. this particular role where he's supposed to play someone who's struggling to feel something. Right, but has also yeah. like not to like forgive anything, but like at least in his case, it feels def- like a defensive posture. You know, like part part of the disaffectedness of everybody is defensive. Yeah, exactly. Right. Of like prior hurt and the recoiling of like potential future hurt. Yeah, man, this movie bummed me out. This was a this is a sort of bleak little movie. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was also really interesting for it to happen so early in Keanu's career. And, uh, yeah. I guess the cops are... No, especially in, compared indignant. to flying. Like, well, flying and, and then this. It's actually kind of a fascinating, like, yeah, you know, comparison a... to, to flying because <laughs> you got flying, which is trying to be one kind of 80s teen movie. Yeah, exactly. And then this is a very different <laughs> yeah. kind of 80s teen movie. And it's the same year. Yeah. Well, exactly. And, and you have Keanu playing one type of 80s teen character and then another one. And actually, oh, Honestly, also, here's my, 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 my thing, my, my little uh, idea for... River's Edge, I think the movie... I, I don't have a very specific idea for this, but I think if you replace Crispin Glover with one of, uh, one of like, the Brat Pack people, mm -hmm. uh, I think the movie would be stronger. I might agree with you. I could see, I think I just I could enjoy, see River Phoenix. I enjoy his batshit performance just for the, its yeah. own sake. But, but yeah, does I see River what you Phoenix mean. Really qualify anything. as Brat Pack? No, but... Or did he... He was, was he like, I don't he, know. He's not in any John Hughes movies. He's not in like. He's not a Brat Pack. Not like St. Elmo's. Uh, that's St. That's uh, St. Elmo's prerequisite Fire. is to yeah. be in a John Hughes movie. It, it doesn't have to be John Hughes, but also just just around that, that period. Style, yeah. I, I feel like it's got to be either John Hughes or St. Elmo's Fire. Yeah. I guess River, yeah, yeah. I guess River yeah, was like, a little like, young. Like, like Rob Lowe counts, but he isn't in a John Hughes movie. But Rob Lowe is in the movie we're talking about next week. Because next week we're talking about Young Blood. And I saw the trailer for this, and boy, does it look goofy. It's about, fantastic. It's about hockey. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, looking care. up now. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a movie starring Rob Lowe, Patrick Swayze. Oh. And then Keanu. Keanu is actually like... like he's a small role in it. It, 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 it. He's not one of the leads. He's not on the poster. But it's, you know, Rob Lowe and Swayze. I enjoy those two actors. 86. Uh, it's insane how attractive Rob Lowe was in the 80s. And how he's aged pretty well. I know he's got some plastic surgery, but well, yeah, he's an ex incredibly vain but man. But like, because man, he was, so he was pretty, you right? Know? Yeah. So is Swayze though. Swayze, oh, don't They're get like me out started. of control. Yeah. Well, well so Swayze has a bit more of the ruggedness. Rob Lowe almost looks just like beautiful. It he looks like beautiful. a Ken doll. He's a Ken doll. I know both. Right. But both of these men he's... are not believable hockey players. <laughs> like, no, they're not. Like none of them have any cuts. And or that's why I'm excited about it. And Keanu, beautiful hockey. <laughs> uh, Keanu plays a character named. Here we go. Heaver. He Okay. What? We'll find know. out next, next time week. on uh, a future on installment of Can't Get Enough of Keanu. And so uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Keanu Podcast. Send us some emails if you want to reach out to us, Keanu Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can uh, you know chat about this stuff in the subreddit, r slash thrillums. And, um, and we still haven't figured out a good sign off yet. So please give us ideas. Yeah, once again, think for us. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Yes. Also, and uh, I just want to make sure we we reiterate this over and over again. Um, we still want Josh Hartnett to come on the podcast. But Josh, <laughs> if you want, you can not talk about yourself at all, and you can only talk about Keanu. Yeah. yeah. Maybe That'll that's cool what was episode. keeping you. Yeah. yeah. Right. Josh, come on the show. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back in a week. We'll be all back. Right, Love bye. you guys. <laughs>